GNT show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discussion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Star Trek, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the GNT show. Our continuing mission, to explore Star Trek storytelling, to seek out new worlds and interesting characters, to boldly go where no show has gone before. Naomi, Naomi Wildman. I was setting it up. Oh. Welcome to the G&T show, where obviously we have no script. Yeah, let's just get this puppy started. As always, the beautiful, the lovely, the high-booted, short-skirted, and big-breasted Terry Lynn. <laughs> that would be me. Admiral Shaw. Badass. It's Serenium <laughs> Cup Day. <laughs> Good morning. It's Sunday on the G&T show. You know the worst part of this morning? It's not the getting up early. It's the fact they're making me wear clothes to do the show. It's time for coffee class. <laughs> Strap on your helmets, boys and girls. It's going to get rough. Oh, it's going to be one of those mornings. Let me put on my seatbelt, my helmet, with the little blinky light on top. For safety. Well, we decided. <laughs> we were going to do the GNT show. Man. One of the things we said was no standards. GNT show does not go on the air because we're ready. It goes on the air because it's nine o'clock on Sunday morning. Mike could have snapped by then and killed us both. Pain sticks for Mike, evidently. <laughs> we have our production meetings on the air. Well, it's the best way to get you to adhere to things. Yeah, you've now set an expectation. Oh, That's the thing about the GNT show is we set no expectations. I need more coffee. Wow. This... I'm trying to figure out whether or not I want to do general news or Star Trek news, and I figured this is out. Terry okay. having a series of small it's strokes, news. actually. Well, it You're doesn't take long for this show to, to <laughs> deteriorate, does it? straight the fuck downhill. <laughs> I don't always podcast, but when I do, I G&T. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the G&T Show, episode 150. I'm Terry Lynn. Joe fucking Lon, true bitches, how are you? 150. And in honor, look at Terry wearing her, her bikini with the 150 sash going across. Adorable, if, if not you. scandalous. <laughs> and sorry, just I think he just scratched 150 into his armor. Wait, wait to look good, pal. Thank you. I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> not even a couple off. I know. He's so old that there's not even a couple. Thank you. <laughs> All right. There you go. And in, in for our 150th episode, we have some royalty with us today. <laughs> The purple robes flowing, the crown slightly askew. It's our lordship. Not in the way of, uh, like, religion, but in the way of, like, dukedom. Royalty. Yeah, royalty <laughs> and, and and all of that. Hello, sir. Welcome back, Mr. James Swallow. And he's on mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. He, he muted himself. We love him. You can unmute yourself now. He may be on the phone. <laughs> he might be on the phone. Maybe that gunshot was a spurned ex-lover. Did he drop his phone? Now I'm all worried. I know, right? <laughs> Well, this is going swimmingly. Isn't it? It's so, it's such a typical GNT show. I couldn't fucking talk this morning and I had to re- Oh my God. <laughs> well, when he figures out how to unmute his mic or if he's muted for a reason, and hopefully it is for a fun reason and nothing too serious, Mr. James Swallow will join us and we'll just dance. Maybe that bitch in the well is screaming again. <laughs> until, until he can join us, we can, talk, we can, we can get to the coffee clutch. <clears throat> so, what you guys been up to this week? Mike, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, let's see. I wrote a little bit. Um, 17,000 words. I'm currently sitting at on my wow. stone novel. Um, I'm below my NaNoWriMo pace, but I'm not trying to, I'm not trying that insanity, <laughs> that pace right now. Um, Dayton and Kevin were talking about Planet of the Apes, um, about the proper so viewing good. order. No, they were talking about the proper viewing order for the old ones, the classics. So I decided to start watching those since, you know, I haven't seen the, the new one yet. Yep. He's, um, hi James. There he is. I can't yeah. work with these people. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where's my agent? <laughs> Welcome back. Hello. Hello. Well, everybody, James is with us now. Say hello. Are you? Are we sure? I think so. I, I am pretty convinced. He says he can't work with us, so that it, <coughs> it does sound like. Ladies sounds like there's a hello, fight American. going on. Like Peter Griffin's fighting the chicken in the background there. <laughs> Well, I mean, he's a writer. I don't know where he's getting his inspiration from. It might be television. James? Hello. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I feel like he's playing like... with our heads at this point. I think you're right. It could be, it could be a delay, you know, set up, you know, broadcasting through time. I think he has us streaming at the same time. Yeah, it sounds like it. So he's probably confused. 
<laughs> it's all it's all it's all weird to me. Okay, how's that? Are we all clear now? Oh, you can turn off your radio collar. <laughs> You're sounding better. Much there, better. that's mu- that's much better. Okay, much better. So, Mike, w- which ones have you watched thus far? I'm currently watching. I've watched the. Uh, Four out of the five, I'm about oh. less than halfway through Battle. Oh, I'm so sorry about Battle. <laughs> We're um, talking about Dayton and Kevin, Dayton Ward and Kevin Dilmore's uh, recent discussion of Planet of the Apes. You know, you're not a real fan unless order. you unless you watch the cartoon series. I remember that. I did, I, I, I did not know that there was a cartoon series. There were also two TV series, Mike. I did know that, uh, that there was a TV series, and I got one of them. Well, you know, the interesting thing about the Planet of the Apes, the, the original series, was uh, the, the as the budgets went down, uh, it just became painful to watch. Although, I have to admit, I liked Conquest. That, that and was it, the one where they... With they Ricardo up, Montalban? Well, he was... Ricardo was in two of them. I, this, uh, Conquest yeah, was right. the third one. Escape is the one where Cornelius and Zero were in the 1960s. Okay. And then Conquest was the next one. Yes. Okay. I'm with you now. So, James, do you have a favorite one of the eight? <laughs> Here. He's muted, he's muted again. Know. Oh, there he goes. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Sorry, just went to the gamma quadrant there for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a favorite planet of the eight? Me, um, yeah. The original, I guess. Because I mean, it's you know, I mean, who can beat Charlton Heston? Because you know, he's he's just got such fantastic lines of dialogue. You know, when he goes to the, that, that scene where he meets the, the the human woman and he he goes over and he strokes her face and he says, Nova, Nova. Do you love? Can you love? And I was just you know, I love that dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Where he's walking along through the desert with his mate, and he says to him, uh, he, he says, my God, how, how long have we been missing from Earth? And he says, you're immortal now, tiger. How does it taste? It's just, you can't get better dialogue than that. <laughs> very, very true. Oh, yeah, well, I forgot Friday, about that. Well, Friday night, I went and saw Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. How was that? Oh, dude, it's fucking awesome. It, it, I, I made the mistake of not going to the bathroom before the movie started. <laughs> oh, no. And it's a long movie. I did not move the entire there was no way I was moving. And, uh, you know, I mean this as a joke, but I also mean it seriously. It's a goddamn crying shame when they've got the the technology now to make Caesar look so damn impressive. And he has way more character and facial features and expression than Kristen Stewart. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Oh my! <laughs> but no, it is amazing. It, 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 yeah, I can't I'm hearing even the be- same thing. Can't even begin to describe the. And you, this is one of those films you want to see on the big screen, just because. I don't think on the small screen you can appreciate the amount of technical work that went into this movie. And Caesar is a goddamn leader, I'll tell you that. I was ready to follow him after the beginning of this movie. <laughs> cool. Oh, I look forward to seeing it. But are you enjoying them, Mike? Yeah, I am. Although I have to admit, I'm, there was, uh, I, I'm also reading um, Full Circle from, uh, <laughs> from the Voyager series. And both of them make a point that just both pissed me off. <gasps> And it both had to do... Wait a minute, Ms. Byer should not pick... Go ahead, these are fighting words, because you know I love her. (laughs) And both had to do do with evolution. Okay, go ahead. Terry was going to say something. Oh, no, I was going to say that Mike is smart enough not to take... Not to take it out on the author, but the story. Yeah, the story. Well, in Planet of the Apes, um, they said that uh, that the humans had evolved into these uh, mindless, you know, creatures, these wild men, so to speak. And in in the uh, Full Circle novel, um, during the, you know Balana's portion where she was, they were wrapping up the you know the the previous storylines. Um, they had she had described how Klingon's future evolution was for them to become more brutish, more violent, more, more monster like and I just I just I just really took offense to that. I mean I don't think evolution works in that way. <laughs> In, in, in what? In a negative way? Well, yeah, essentially going backwards. In terms of, of the Klingons, we've seen what Klingons look like previously with, you know, their past evolution. Uh, we saw it in that episode where the whole Enterprise D crew de evolves, you know, and and the way that she described them, you know, as the, the Peclier, uh, as she called them, um, it just, for me, it just, uh, 
I'm trying to figure out. Apparently, um, he James Mike keeps getting muted, but it's not something he's doing. What's up with Teamspeak today? It's self muting. I've never seen That's anything odd. like that. I want if he's writing at the same time, he might be hitting a keystroke. That yeah, muted. That could be what's happening. Oh, so under under yeah, hit a hot key. I was gonna say, I'd, oh, Hello. there he is. There he is. Hello. That's that's weird. I don't know what's going on there with that. Yeah, we think sw- you might be hitting a hot key that's set up. I don't have my I don't have my hands on the keyboard at all. Actually, I don't know what's going really? on. Really? Give me a second. Oh. I'm going to switch headsets. Okay. Okay. Oh, now, Mike. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the fun things, though, about the original Planet of the Apes series is Roddy McDowell's performance as Cornelius throughout. I thought you? that was good. Yes. Yeah. Although I have to admit, he knew the Cornelius from from the 2001 remake. <laughs> Oh, I laugh. Oh, I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> From a 2001 remake? Yeah, the one with uh, Mark Wahlberg in it. Oh, oh, that Tim Burton one. Yeah, I, I watched that one recently as well. And, oh, I laugh. <laughs> well, you know, the ending of that movie is way more consistent with the, the novel. Oh, really? Yeah, if what, you read I, the novel, you won't even recognize it. Hello. Hey. There, he there he is. Oh, cool. If you read <laughs> the novel, you won't even recognize the, the same universe as the, the, the original movie series. <laughs> James has a, our speakers open. Do you, don't, do you have a headset on, James? Yep, just setting up now. Oh, okay. How's that? Is that coming out clearer? Much. Oh, yeah. No more echo. Excellent. There we Thank go. You. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. <laughs> yeah, we're getting it through. We're getting it done. <laughs> now I don't hear anything. But now you don't hear anything? <sighs> Oh, no. Oh, I feel so bad. I love him so much. And, of course, that's also our cue to be quiet, right? (laughs) No, I'm trying to. to... Well, now he's back. How's that? Well, if we talk, you can hear ourselves. So we do. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, but that's, uh, you're you're getting feedback from my end. Is that what's happening? It sounds like you have have us coming through speakers on your computer. computer. I do, but when I switch over to my headset, I can't hear you anymore. Please bear with us, everyone. Okay, I'm hearing you. Nothing. Uh, if anybody's hearing anything from me, say so in the chat room. We hear you. Okay. That's great. I can't, okay, that's terrific. I can't hear a word you guys are saying. Though. Well, because we're not talking right now. There we are. <laughs> no, no. It's okay. That's what we have to edit. That's what we edit for. Yeah, it looks like I'll be busy today. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I really have been enjoying the Planet of the Apes film. So thank you, Dane, for that suggestion. And Kevin, um, it has been interesting. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen them. Some of these I've never seen. Yeah. And yeah. It's been it's been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, what about you? Oh well, speaking of interesting, <laughs> yesterday I attended the Great Allentown Comic Con. I saw a lot of pictures. The one day Comic Con in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Right the the big guests were uh, uh sorry. You had a brain fart there for a moment. Yeah, were, uh, Nicholas Brandon, who played Xander on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. All right. But, wow, hell of a nice guy. Yeah. When you when you paid, you know, to get the autograph thing, it also came with a hug. Aww. Yeah, and a photo that he took <laughs> with everybody. He was a really nice guy. He, he really. And, uh, um, I don't know what he's been doing, but you should see the guns on him. Yeah, Xander, <laughs> Xander. Xander took us to the gun show yesterday. <laughs> um, also had a couple of the Power Rangers there, the Red Power Ranger and the Yellow Power Ranger. Cool. So that Hi, was James. interesting. Mike Chuck. Hello. Can you hear us? You can are. you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. 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 It sounds like... Well, that was a complete waste of time. I've just gone back to the old headset again. Oh, okay. <laughs> technology. <laughs> Gotta love it. <laughs> James, you need to be firing some staff at this point. <sighs> yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, you. I'm looking at you. You're fired. Stop weeping. Get out. I don't Spy care if you have we- wife and children. Just go. Yeah, it's your fault. Go on. Don't give me that look. I'm talking to the cat now. She's just like, what? No. <laughs> and um, I'm just telling you about my adventures yesterday at uh, the great Allentown Comic Con. And cool. uh, like, yeah, there was some really good cosplay there. Some really good. Um, I I went because it was a two and a half hour drive to go. But one of the reasons I wanted to go was one of my favorite cosplayers in the world was there. Um, if you've watched uh, Heroes of Cosplay, you've seen her, Riddle, Ricky, and uh, yeah. she she was. So 
sweetest lady. Oh my God. I, my friend Lindsay, who I've talked about here, um, went with me and afterwards even she was like, oh my God, if she was any sweeter, I'd have a toothache. <laughs> but, what about what about you? What about you, Mr. Swallow? What have you been what, up to this week? It sounds like you've been a little busy. You guys don't have to call me Mr. Swallow. You know, you can just call me Jim. <laughs> it's fine. You know, you know, only it's like when someone calls me Mr. Swallow, I, I expect the next thing for them to say, will the defendant please rise? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, what have I been doing? Yeah, I've been I, I've I've been doing lots of stuff. Um, I am currently working on a new Star Trek novel, um, hey. and that's a new Titan book. It's called Sight Unseen. And I'm sorry, I just started out. to cry. I'm so happy. Are you kidding? You're crying? Oh. I just no. I've been, I'm well. I, I I did get a little misty eyed. Yeah, I get oh, so gee, happy. Oh, make sure it doesn't suck then. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because evidently Mike, then you'll be crying for a completely different reason. Evidently, Mike is uh, is anti Christian buyer at this point. I'm not. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, hey, I won't, I won't hear a bad word said about a homegirl Kristen, right? I okay. know, right? <laughs> I'm not talking bad about her. I just didn't agree with something she had written. He called her names. And he, he burned, did not. He burned he his copy not. of Full Circle Stop being in a protest. Shit disturber. He did not. Oh, now, I'm shaking my head. <sighs> when, is your here's what, when is your manuscript? When, when, is, when can we expect this new Titan book? Um, That's a very good question. Um, I think... We're looking at 2015. Um, let me check, actually. I'll, I'll, I've got my schedule right in front of me. I'll see if I can give you an exact or at least a rough kind of date for it. Um, but it is going to be um, it's it's going to be a, a Titan novel. It's going to be a full novel. Not going to be part of like an ongoing series or anything like we did with the Fall. It's going to be a standalone. Nice. And it's kind of going to be. I guess I guess I'd call it. Like, it's a transitional novel in a way. It's a transitional story because we're picking up from the fallout from the Fall, which turned up a little bit in uh, John Jackson Miller's ebook story, um, Absent Enemies. And then this is going to pick up with that, and it's going to be kind of reflecting some of the changes that have gone on after the fall and some of the changes of the characters. I think that should be hitting stores around the fall of 2015, I think, is the plan at the moment. Nice. Right on. Well, I do want to congratulate you for, for what, your, uh, what, you, what you did with, the, with your novel this, in the fall. That was totally amazing. Thank Congratulations you. on New York seller yes. notch on your belt, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I was very pleased about that. That's um, my first ever Trek book on the New York Times bestseller list, the third one that I've had so far, and um, I'm very, very pleased about it. And thanks to everybody who bought a copy, because uh, I wouldn't have got on that list if it hadn't been for you guys so everybody out there uh, thank you I really appreciate your support and I know that all the rest of the guys on the on the full uh, the full team feel the same way (laughs) no we don't well, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of this. I've got this huge list of people now who, you know, are saying to me, like, so when am I going to be in your novel? And I'm thinking, I'm just going to put them all on one spaceship and have it explode at the beginning and go, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've read you all in the book. Now you're all well, dead. Shut up. Uh, Terry, Terry made a valid point, a very okay. valid point. Until the G&T show existed, a whole okay. bunch of the Star Trek novelists were not New York Times bestseller. <laughs> now that you've been on our show, the GNT effect kicks in. Oh, uh, so there's a correlation there. Is that what you're saying? I see. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> but, well, you whether know, whether or think... not we have any evidence to substantiate this claim is... We're on the level moot. three diagnostic on that to check to see if it's true. But, you know, yeah, I mean, there could be something there. Do you really think Dayton would have made the New York Times bestseller list if it wasn't for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. No. You know that. Well, you know, he has skills in areas that you're not aware of. I mean, those guys in New York, you know, it's got pictures. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, besides Star Trek novel writing, uh, what other projects are you up to? Because um, I know you. You're always busy. Yeah, I am super busy. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm working on a top secret video game project, which is probably the most secret thing I've ever done, ever, ever, ever. Oh, tell us about um, it. Just <laughs> giving us that much. Yeah, like, that's not going to happen. Um, let me put it this way: if you if you look back through, uh, you know, my social media thing, you might get a couple of clues. But I'm not going to say any more of it than that. But it's a very cool thing, and I'm really really happy to be part of it. But that's not going to be um, sort of hitting the airwaves. That's not none of that stuff's going to be announced at least for like six months. But it's a very very cool project, 
and I'm super stoked about it, working some, with some really, really clever, talented people. So that's a lot of fun. I love, I love doing video games. Anyway. Um, and beyond that, I have a, uh, a novel coming out next month, uh, tying into the new series of 24. That's oh. my first ever thriller novel. I mean, I'm a big fan of, of, of action thriller stuff as well as sci-fi. And I've written a novel called Deadline, and that's coming out at the beginning of August. And it's a sequel to the last season of 24, which was season 8, and a prequel to the current miniseries, 24 Live Another Day. And it's basically the story, it, it starts one hour after the end of season 8, and it tells the story of how Jack Bauer gets out of New York and gets involved in another sort of unpleasant situation with lots of stuff blowing up and him kicking people's asses and saying, damn it, and, you know, <laughs> and generally just doing all that cool stuff that Jack Bauer does. And that has been a lot of fun because I'm a huge fan of 24. I've been watching that show since the very beginning, and having the right dialogue for Jack Bauer was, was pretty damn cool. <laughs> Right that on, is right so on. awesome. That is so cool. I did not know that you were involved in doing tie-in for 24. That's great. Yeah, it was. Um, I got a call um, from actually from. Um, it does actually have a Star Trek connection because the books are being published by um, Tor Forge Books, and of oh. course our good friend Marco Palmieri Marco. is working at Torge. And it was it was Marco who actually threw my name into the hand and uh, said to the editor, you know, if you're looking for someone who likes this kind of stuff, you might want to talk to Jim. And I was like, thank you, Marco. You are my best friend ever. And uh, and so when they came to me, they said, uh, you know, uh, do you think you could do 24? I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I'm so all over that, you know. And uh, and it was it was a very intense schedule as well because I had to write the book in 48 days. So it was one of the most compressed timelines I've ever worked on. But I, I kind of used that because I thought, well, you know. Does it have 24 chapters? I'm sorry, as, um, I can help myself. <laughs> it, it, it does have 24 chapters. Yes, it does. Oh, it, and it does take place over a 24-hour period. Right on, so right it's on. like each chapter is not like one hour of time or anything like that, but it is 24 chapters long. And um, and all the way through it, I could hear Jack Bauer's voice in my head doing this. <laughs> so I'm reading out my dialogue to myself when I'm doing the Jack Bauer voice. Damn it, Chloe. And all that kind of stuff. So that's really cool. It's, it, and it's, you know, I'm really enjoying the new series as well because it's set in my hometown of London. And uh, and that's kind of fun going, oh, I know where that place is. Oh, yeah, I worked around the corner from there. You know, so that was kind well, of cool. When we um, when we got our dogs, when we had two dogs from the same litter, they were from a C litter, and our female dog was Chloe, and we tossed around the idea of changing her name when we got her, and then we realized no, nah, we could just think of her as being named after Chloe from Twenty Four. So we love her. Her character rocks too. Be honest, you named her after Chloe Savigny. No. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, do. But I think we have like the first five seasons. And it was after they they, they set off the nuke in Ventura County that I kind of went, oh, yeah. That, that kind of jumped the shark for me at that point. But there are still things about it that make me laugh and that I like. And again, it's just because it's the super crazy uh, adventure, like you said, adventure. And there is just something endearing and charming and funny about it. Jack, that I'll watch it. James, quick question. Yeah. Do you at least allow Jack to go to the bathroom in your book? Well, he's done that on the show, you know. There oh, is, has there he? Is, yeah, there is. There is. People say, oh, you know, there's all the stuff that Jack never gets to do. There, there is an episode where he's he um he, I can't remember the series, but he's in, he's in like a he's in a construction site and uh, and he's he's taken this girl hostage and he's hiding out in this thing and and he goes into a room and you hear a toilet flush and he comes back out again. So Jack has been to the bathroom because I, I there would is a suggest list of maybe that's why. Jack is so about. tense. He's, well, you know, he's really takes, blocked. <laughs> Well, what do you think he's doing in those commercial breaks, you know? I mean, you get like a five-minute commercial break. That's what he's doing. He's stopping his car on the side of the road and just stepping behind a bush for a pee or something. But there is a lot of stuff that happens to Jack that, you know, that I decided all the other things, right, that happens to that never happened to Jack. I thought, right, okay, I'm going to put these in my book. So there is a scene where he gets bad cell phone reception. There is a scene where he runs out of ammunition. There is Thank a scene you where so he... very much. The bad cell phone reception is perfect. That's perfect. There is a scene where he ha he stops to have something to eat <laughs> and and there is also a scene where he has a nap so oh, very cool. so very cool. so all and and it all were and I even came up with a way to, to work all of that into the story to make it make all, all make sense so so uh, all of those things now people say oh well, he never did this he did he did that in Jim's book that's awesome, awesome. <laughs> we'll we'll definitely tout that up that's great any other projects you're working on because I, I like I said it's one one other book and one video game is not what James Swallow normally does <laughs> Oh, let's well, see. Super secret video game thing. I know. There's a. I, I've just Keep... done another audio drama for the Warhammer Forty Thousand series. That's coming out at the end of the year. That's called Shield of Lies. We've just finished recording that. 
Uh, and that was very cool. Um, and uh, I've also done another short story for them. And then um, after this Star Trek novel is done, after Sight Unseen is finished, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. And then I'm going to work on my next Star Trek novel, which is going to be a TOS novel. Oh! And that's kind of, um, you know, none of that's been officially scheduled yet, but I've, I have definitely been contracted for it. Um, and I can't say a lot about it, but I can, well, I guess what I can say about it is I wanted to write a TOS novel that was reminiscent of all the things that I love the most about that show. So I wanted to do something that feels big and brassy and kind of, you know, colorful and, and action packed. So it's kind of in the mold of episodes like the immunity syndrome or the doomsday machine, you know, there's, there's, it's there's a lot of cool stuff going on there awesome. because that's awesome. the, the, one of my favorite areas of Star Trek because, you know, I'm, I'm a classic Trek fan through and through and I wanted to write an era story where it's, it's Kirk, Spock and McCoy, you know, in the, in the, uh, you know, the, the yellow and blue and red uniform era kind of a Star Trek. So I'm looking forward to doing that, but that won't be for a while yet. So is awesome. video game part of a franchise? I'm not going to answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He'll keep trying, James. I'm just like, uh, I'm not going to say. I became so stoked this week. I pre-ordered uh, Alien Isolation. I cannot wait to get that game. Uh, my friend Dan was one of the writers on that. That looks pretty good. Wow, and that does pre- look pretty good. You know about the the, the, the pre-order version, the, the special yeah, features? Yeah, with the 1979. Apparently, that's uh, you will be able to get that after the pre-order as well. If you don't pre-order it, it will be available to, you know, having all of the original cast reprising all their roles, which is super awesome. That is just un- unbelievable. They could, Terry, they got Sigourney Weaver. I know, and, I and saw. We, you saw that? Yeah. I did. And, and the, you and get the, to play as each one, like in the, their pivotal scene in the movie. That's cool. I, really I want to really know if, um, who, if they've managed to get um, Jones the Cat back, though. No, you know what I understand? His agent was holding out for way too much money. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> That's so like him. What an asshole. I know. <laughs> Such a diva. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yesterday I went to the to this great Allentown Comic Con, and um, yeah, it, I got to tell you, one of the most bizarre cons I've ever been to. It's held in a building where they they also have a flea market. So you've got these really narrow hallways where people are selling like old lamps and porcelain dolls and things. And then it just opens into this room where it's panel room one. And so you can like put in bids on things for the flea market as you're going around. And the second floor had the self-described world's greatest pro wrestling and memorabilia museum because it was on the same location where in the 1970s, the World Wide Wrestling Federation, which is now the World Wrestling Entertainment, taped their show once a month. And um, yeah, it was everything you'd expect in a flea market. Interesting. But well, we the, don't really, we don't actually have uh, a flea market. We don't have we don't have the same kind of thing. We have um, what we call boot sales. Do you know? Do you guys familiar with that? It's basically like where a bunch of people will drive their cars into a field in the middle of nowhere. And sell stuff out the back of the car. Yeah, I, that sounds like a, a a type of flea market. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that would be the yeah. No, this is picture a big agricultural building designed in the 1930s or 40s with hallways that smell of old pine wood and and no air conditioning and about a thousand or so people milling around, cosplaying and sweating. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that smells like fandom. That's cool. Well, this weekend. I mean, here in the UK, we've got um, the the London Film and Comic Con is on this weekend, and oh, that's, uh, that's the one, Stacy Rebecca. Okay, that's a pretty that that's a pretty huge event. Uh, a lot of my friends are along doing um, cool stuff at that. That's cool. Now, that's... Is it, it's a two day event. Yeah, yeah, London Film and Comic Con. I, I think it might it may even be three days actually. I think. It's yeah. it's um it's a mix of everything. I mean, they have like kind of props there and stuff. I know they've got some of the vehicles from the Transformers movies are there, and there's there's actors, there's um, TV people, there's um, writers and stuff there. My my good friend Ben Aranovich, who's a novelist, who's doing a, a series of um, uh, urban fantasy novels. He was there today, just tweeting about it, telling me how great it was, and uh, tweeted me a picture of a guy dressed up like Doctor Manhattan who'd come to see him. Uh, not just the not the naked Doctor Manhattan. I I, I hasten to add, you know, he was actually wearing a nice Hat. suit. 
And, Fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and I know a lot of the Doctor Who people have been there this weekend as well, dropping some hints about the the new season of Doctor Who. There, there was a great cosplay yesterday. This little girl was dressed up like the TARDIS, and she had a Kermit the Frog dressed like David Tennant's Doctor that she was carrying around with her. It was adorable. That's cute. <laughs> right on. <laughs> oh, yeah. but my, my favorite cosplay yesterday was this girl who was walking around with a poster, uh, like a poster board around her neck, and it said, I'm cosplaying as a background character. <laughs> Well, James, you're welcome to stay with us while I go through the Star Trek news. We would love to hear your in- your input on some of it. Sure, okay. Awesome. Star Trek news? I am so proud to be a talkie geek. We've got our problems with the film, which we'll get into on our dopey little podcast and nitpick it to death. Star Trek news? So congratulations to the always dreamy David Mack. There's Legos? Oh, no. Star Trek news? Yes, the story behind the story. The movie <laughs> that never was made. They got a Klingon! I know. Sold. That's right. I'm gonna throw in a buck the high rookie guard. That's right. A buck the high for people. It doesn't get any bigger than this. Star Trek news. Let's get to it. We got to copy and paste this right out of the gate, you guys. We're going to be talking about Star Trek Three. Uh, recently, uh, I Bob Orsi picked- is saying the right things. I got to say, Bob Orsi oh. is now saying that. Well, as of last night, he has withdrawn from Spider-Man Three. He is no longer in or Spider-Man franchise, no longer involved. And really? whether that means he's going to be concentrating on Star Trek, we don't know. He is saying that he has not yet been confirmed as director. And also that the Paramount hasn't signed off on the script. Yeah, that they haven't greenlit it yet. No, it's not even that. The script isn't even done! Oh. Yeah, they're still, he said they're in the middle of it. <laughs> it's July of 2014. <laughs> How come I get the feeling, you know, this is going to be a rust job. I'm so worried. Time. I'm so worried. They're still writing it. They're still writing it. Yeah, that's Which Hollywood makes... for you, though, sweetheart. That's the way it works. Sweet. <sighs> I'm, Trust I'm, me, baby, that's Hollywood. I know. <laughs> <laughs> now now we know it's going to be a December 20... Yeah, now we know it's going to be a December 2016 release. That way they can still say they got it in during the 50th anniversary. <laughs> Released on December 31st, mm-hmm. 2016. I'm thinking this is going to be in is the editing be a, room. Is it going to be a midnight showing? <laughs> no, that wouldn't count. It would have to be 11 59 It's still. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned. I am, I am concerned that. Um... Harry, I think your fears are unfounded. We were all concerned going into Into Darkness, and look, that came. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, Zachary Quinto and Roberto Orsi were, were uh, kind of talking together and this was picked up by IGN saying that um, quote unquote Quinto says I think the five year mission will be part of this next film in some way that would be fun but again not unlike what Mr. Swallow is doing with his uh, as yet unnamed unidentified video game everybody's being very hush hush about this and that's okay can I give one professional piece of advice to Mr. Orsi. Stop doing interviews and maybe you'd finish the script. <laughs> James, we're not Hey, you know what? You. Bob Orsi's not your bitch, man. You know? <laughs> give the guy a, give the guy a break, right? You know, he's, he's, he's got it. You know, he walks out of his house. He's like, man, that script is really kicking my ass. And the guy's like, hey, Bob! And just puts a microphone in his face. And he's like, dude, I'm just going for coffee. But hey, Bob, can you just talk about... Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, uh, the script's going to be great. Can I go to Starbucks now? Yeah, okay, okay. And he gets to Starbucks and he goes... Can I get a latte, please? What name would you like on it, Bob Orsi? Bob Orsi! Oh, Bob, I love your show! Hey, wait a minute, let me get my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bob Orsi's life right now, you know? Give the guy a break. Uh, that is no. Point. Sorry, I'm, stand- I'm just standing up for my fellow writers there, you know? I know. Well, you know, I, I'm going to say, I said that jokingly because I'm going to tiny, tiny scroll, but it, 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 it connects. Um, Johnny Football, Johnny Manziel, is taking a lot of heat for, like, going to Vegas on the weekends and, quote, not studying. What? But yet everybody else does the same thing. They either go home or they go and do something. I'm like, why is this one guy being singled out for, you know what I mean? They're saying, well, he should be studying. Well, he's a rookie. They, they're not going to give him a whole lot yet. Oh, never mind. It's, and, it's, and it's no just, offense, study for what? The playbook. Oh. Yeah, yeah you don't know so, what that guy's process is. You know, maybe he, need, maybe he needs to roll some dice to get his head into the game. That's just where he is. You know, don't judge him. Yeah, not everybody's Peyton Manning who lives and breathes at 24-7. And look where Peyton Manning is. With Eli having more Super Bowl rings than him. Oh, uh, that's got to hurt at Thanksgiving. That's it's really got to hurt, yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys are talking about sports ball now. Okay. He's right. talking about, yeah. Uh, very sorry yeah. about your English football team yeah. there, James. It's not. So you oh, congratulations to the Netherlands. In, in football, either. 
see, I mean, it's going to be an interesting match tonight because it's by, for for being a British people, it's it's um, you know, <laughs> two countries that we're not particularly fond of that we both went to war with, mm-hmm. having a having a fight over a football match. So most British people are going to be like, yeah, what the hell, we're going to go down the pub. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, again, in America, I don't think I think there might be four people. Oh, stop that! <laughs> stop with your fucking Dayton like hatred of soccer. Now there's a difference between hatred and apathy and bitches that want to complain about no scoring that germany brazil match they could suck it after that and for no scoring there's been more scoring in this world cup than tampa bay's done in the last two years oh i said it moving on with star trek news see this is what this is why i prefer watching ice hockey because you know i I enjoy the violence and has a little bit more to hold my interest that dude did break his spine you saw that? I yeah. think it was from Argentina. Terry, he broke his spine. I don't know. I don't watch soccer. He broke his spine. Well, good. Now he can say what? that he's... Good? No, what? I don't mean good for him. It's sad that he got hurt. You hear what she's dude. like, James? You hear, this is the Terry that nobody else gets to hear normally. But somehow, <laughs> when you're here, we the, the real Terry comes out. I'm, I'm bringing out the worst in her, oh, clearly. In ice <laughs> hockey, the guy's jugular got slit. Oh, suck it up, buttercup, and get back on the there ice. There you go. See? Same attitude. Yeah, and he's got a thousand pounds of gear on. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Congratulations to Miss Kate Mulgrew on her yes. Emmy nomination for Orange is the New Black. If you remember, I tweeted it was Emmy worthy. It was. And I think it's her first, yeah, it is her first Emmy nomination ever. So congratulations to her. We're very excited. I think the Emmys will be, what, in six weeks or so? I don't know. I kind of don't pay attention anymore to the Emmys. Didn't there used to be like the award season where they were all grouped into the same time? Now it seems like they've stretched it out a little bit. Kind of. Emmys were always a little bit offset because the television seasons are, are different. Oh, yeah, that's true because it, the September used to be the start of. Right, right. And now now their, their fiscal year is different. <laughs> It, yeah, it, it really. I think their fiscal year starts in like August, doesn't it? August. It's like August or September or something. Yeah, it's kind of trippy. Um, what else is going on? Oh, there's a great article at Pride Source, which is an LBGT uh, uh, website that has a wonderful uh, conversation with George Takei, talking about what his, you know, his career, talking about. Uh, closeted, being a closeted actor, and then, um, you know, just the step forward we've made with representations of uh, gays in media. I would highly recommend people read this. It's very good. You know, I got. I want to jump in there and say something about yeah. about George, you know, which I think is, do you remember when uh, there was the, this is a few years back now, but do you remember when George came out publicly? Yes. And, and there was a really big deal about it? Yeah. And, and everybody made a really huge issue? And I can remember that, I don't know if this is true of, of U.S. fandom, but it was certainly true of British Star Trek fandom, is we were all kind of like, yes, yeah, so what? <laughs> we, we all knew for years. I can remember going to a Star Trek convention in 1988, and George came with his mum, and, and yeah. nobody kind of nobody kind of blinked about it, and we were all kind of like, hey, this is Star Trek, this is Idic, you know, yeah, man, if that's cool, you know, that's fine. Yeah. And, yeah. Nobody made a big deal about it. And I remember all these years later, my mother coming to me and saying, hey, that guy on that Star Trek show, he's gay. And I was like, yeah, so what? What, you, you only just found out? Hey, like, you know, duh. <laughs> why, 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 yeah. Why is that a big deal? You know, you know, you know John Barrowman's gay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, James, you missed that. He's you missed that. You missed, yeah, you missed that. There was a, Mr. Mr. Nick recently came to light about Barrowman's orientation, and it was probably one of the funniest episodes we've ever had. Because John, John's, John's he had not no gay. Clue. John's fabulous. He is fabulous. <laughs> well, I see. My fabulous. first clue should have been any man that good looking. I should have known he wasn't straight. <laughs> Have you seen oh, the um, the 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 four the four-ish doctors the the little video that was made by the other Doctor Who actors? No. Oh yes. There's a what what happened was when they were doing the 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 anniversary special, the last set of episodes of Doctor Who, a bunch of the other actors. Um, so it's like Sylvester McCoy and Colin Baker and and Peter Davison, all kind of got together and they were like, okay, you know, we're not going to be in this because they're not interested in having us in the show. But they, they so they made a little spoof video about the three of them trying to get into the next mm-hmm. episode of Doctor Who that was being made. And there's like a, snuck into the, into the studio. And yeah, and it's, it's really, it's, I recommend it. Anybody can watch it. It's up on YouTube. It's really, really funny. But there is a great joke in the middle of it where um, they're picketing outside uh, BBC Television Centre and John Barrowman walks past and he says, you know, they, you know they film it in Cardiff, right? Not in London. 
and they go running over to to chase him and uh, and they find out his terrible John Barrowman's terrible terrible dark secret which is that he has a wife and two little girls he says oh my god please, please don't tell anyone I'm straight and so they blackmail him into driving them to to <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. It was hilarious. But it is very funny. But you guys should look will, it up. It's really cool. I, I, I will say this in my own defense, okay, because I'm not a big Doctor Who watcher. I, well, because – You weren't. I, I really have at to sit down. At the time, you were not. No, and, at the, and I, I can't watch it now because – Karen Gillian's not on, so really, what's the point? But I, I only knew John Barrowman really from Arrow. Okay, oh, okay. yeah, because he's because he's pretty hardcore in that. Isn't it? Yeah, he's a major character in that. So that's that was my first real exposure to him. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> well, there's John. John has a lot of exposure in in the shows that he's done. He's that's, not, the, that's what I'm glad about. That's so it. very true. <laughs> in fact, if you go to a convention, you and John is there, he quite often will do that stuff live as well oh my god i need to go <laughs> yeah now i need to find a con where he's at locally <laughs> no he's he's an uh, that guy is an absolute riot on stage he really is oh i would love to see him now you brought uh, you brought up something fast and real quick nick did you hear about brandon root oh an arrow yeah yeah okay. he's gonna be the atom and so so far we've got katana the atom yeah there's gonna be some really yeah i'm excited <laughs> The, some, some, some more real quick uh, additions. Uh, did you see that uh, Kevin Delmore went to the <laughs> went to the, the the midnight showing of the Star Trek ornament or the Hallmark ornament release? Right. Yes, I did see that. Well, that's part of his job, right? Well, for him, I think it probably. I don't think he had to go. I think they chose to go celebrate. Well, the Star Trek ornaments were released at midnight on Friday night. Oh, is that the Spock ordering a giant pizza one? That's bad. Yes, it is, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the new Star Trek ornaments have been uh, revealed. It is Spock mind-melding with the Horta. Um, we have a new, I think it's Sulu and then Vina, the Orion I'll take a Vina, woman. please. The ship this year is the USS Vengeance. <sighs> It should, by all rights, be half the size of my tree. Uh, <laughs> and it should implode into my Transamerica building in Francisco, my little San Francisco ornament. Hey, maybe that's what I'll do. I think I'll put it into a deep descent on my San Francisco ornament there. Um, so those are it for this year. And yes, I am going to get the vengeance. And not because I absolutely love the ship. But because I never miss a Star Trek ornament, that's all. I have to admit that the angle on on this on this article makes it look really nice. I I, I like the way it looks from this angle. It's admittedly, it's kind of cool. <clears throat> Jimmy, you know, man, like we never Lego. get those those ornaments over here. It's so unfair. you don't. No, if if Do we want to get those ones, Hallmark or? ornaments, no, we don't. They they don't they they don't sell that sort of stuff here. They there are a few stores that sell similar kind of things, but but getting hold of of those ornaments in the UK is is very very difficult and very expensive. Wow. So those with uh, Hallmark ornaments, we will get Mr. Swallow's address and you can send them to him. <laughs> careful, James. Oh, my girlfriend would absolutely love that. Don't... If, 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 I, if I put the... My girlfriend loves Christmas and she, she whenever it's Christmas time, she's like, okay, get out of the room. I'm in charge of Christmas. I'm the queen of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and all the decorating will be done by the Queen of Christmas, and you will get the hell out of it. And I'm like, yes, dear. And I go and open a bottle of eggnog, and, and I let her do what she does. Do you have Christmas pudding? <clears throat> we do, yes, indeed. With extra alcohol. Like and is. Christmas explodes all over the house, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. You know. it sounds like a so good at it. She does an amazing job, you know. It's awesome. And uh, and but we but we don't have any um, we don't have any uh, Star Trek Christmas ornaments because like I say they're they're so hard to get over here. It's it's weird though you know certain Star Trek stuff. You, I, I see things that are on sale like uh, Think Geek always have such amazing Star Trek stuff. But if oh, you want to yeah. buy it in the UK, you'll be charged maybe half as much again for anything you buy just through through um, tax and through um, through getting it done oh. by UPS and stuff like that. Yeah, the ship. Right. Shipping. Yeah, the, the shipping fee, you know, it's, it's like anything you buy, you go, oh, that's cool. Oh, it's gorgeous. I love that thing. Oh, wait, no, it's going to cost me at least half as much again. So the only way you can do it is, you know, when what I do now is when I travel to the U.S. is I'll order a ton of stuff and get it delivered to my hotel and then ship it back because it's actually cheaper to do it that way. Oh, I believe it's you. ridiculous. I absolutely believe you. Yeah, because you have to pay, but then we you get, have to pay um, duties on to Oh. Yep, we get duties. And, and you'll also pay like... Uh, 
if the if the company that's shipping it for you will pay your duty for you, then you have to pay them the duty back, and then you have to pay them a fee for paying your duty for you. Oh my! So yeah, so it's, it's really kind of really can. Sort it's of a help. scam, I tell you, a scam. Hurley is. But then there's, it's also true. I mean, I, I hear uh, American fans talking to me about the, you know, the, have you guys seen the, the Star Trek official Starships collection that's coming out? Yeah. Yes. With all the I'm a subscriber. Ships, is that's, that's being produced um, here in the UK, um, edited uh, by my good friend Ben Robinson. And uh, those are fantastic. And I'm hearing American fans saying, oh, God, we can't get these things. They're so cool. And yet we, there are stores I, in the UK where they're everywhere. Yeah, I actually now I started I started to subscribe to them. We can get them here now, and I started to subscribe to them a few months ago, and I love them very much. They finally opened a uh, a U.S. source for those. Cool. Yeah, I'm happy. I I'm I'm as a matter of fact, I can talk about it now. Their customer service is almost too good. <clears throat> the very first package or the very first monthly package that I got was the USS Enterprise. It was the the seventeen. 1901 refit, mm -hmm. and it came with another Romulan or a, a Klingon ship. But the nacelle on the refit broke, so I it was broken when I got it. So I sent them an email and said, I will return the broken one. Can I get an exchange? I, all I want is my refit. The person there misunderstood my email and then sent me another 1701D. And now I'm in the midst of trying to say, no, I, I, I don't want the 1701D. I now have two of those. Can I still get my refit? I will send everything back. And they're like, no, don't send us back anything. We'll send you the right one. So <laughs> they're sending me more ships than I need. Wow. I smell giveaways from the G&T show. <laughs> That's cool. You, get the, the, you can put those up on eBay. I know some people have been finding them hard to get hold of. I, I haven't been buying the entire series. I'm not subscribing to it. But um, I'm, I'm just buying all the Starfleet ships. Yep. Um, but I, those I, are very good. Well, having, well, having said, I did, I did pick up the DS9 as well. That was really, really gorgeous. I picked up my uh, Klingon Bird of Prey from Amazon. Um, yeah. I'm not a subscriber either. But uh, yeah, there, there are ways. If you want, want a ship, you can find them. <laughs> They're sweet. That's great. Except the refit. I would totally have just <laughs> paid the 25 bucks or something like that to get another refit. But talk about a very difficult ship to find. So what is it? This, this week, last week, they just had the Zindi alien insectoid ship that just came out and Ooh, I think really? next week is next Wednesday the here in the UK we're getting the USS Prometheus you know the multi-vector mm -hmm. assault mode ship with the four nacelles yeah Sweet. The one I'm thinking about getting the fleet version of in Star Trek Online. <sighs> but, you know, we have to get our Starbase to Tier 5 first. Um, I put in the chat room a link to another uh, piece of funness. It's a Klingon letter opener that I thought Mike would find fun. Yes, to, very to fun. And How do you pronounce that, Michael? The talk. Thank you. And Bless you. It's actually more believable or more to scale, I think, than, say, the bat left letter, letter opener. Yeah. So sure. this is what I want. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very nice. Very, very I like cool. it. And speaking of the refit, they are coming out with a new desktop replica, and it looks like it's pewter. Eight and a half inches long, cast in metal alloy. Very pretty, pretty ship. Oh, that's that can, the QMX one. That was a very nice. Yeah, it is very pretty. And yeah, QMX really pretty. makes some beautiful stuff, I'll tell you. Can you spray paint it gold? And <laughs> I'll tell you what, I picked up a thing in a, a bookstore recently. I don't know if you guys have this in the U.S. Do you have that where you, you know when you go to a bookstore and, and – uh, you go to the, the till to pay, and they have like a, a little sort of spinner rack, and it'll have things on there like a kind of a tiny Zen garden in a box for your desk or a yeah. pocket yeah. crank. Do you have that sort of thing? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, they, they do ones like they, there's a whole series of geek ones, like, you know, a little Batmobile or a Green Lantern ring. Well, they've done one of the classic Constitution class Enterprise, Shut up. and it really? lights up. And it is it, it was it was it was super cheap as well. It was only like about ten pounds. And I thought this can't be very good, but it looks kind of cool. And it comes with a little booklet that tells you like the history of the Enterprise. And I put very this thing together cool. and I flipped the switch, and all these lights come on. I was like, this is so awesome, you know. And so that that was like, I must have that. I must possess this thing. And that's sitting on my shelf right now next to my um, my little Captain Kirk action figure and uh, my um, uh, JJ Prize and my um, my Tron light up uh, data disc. Tons of crap that I've got on my bookshelves here. I almost <laughs> bought yesterday and I, uh, uh, from the um, the motion picture a little Ilea action figure because I, I I haven't seen those very often. Oh, cool. Uh, let's see. Because I figured to... I could cosplay her at some point. <laughs> I got the legs for it. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> 
I will pay you a hundred dollars. I need more than that. Yeah, I, yeah. You say it's gonna be. If I'm gonna dress as Eileen, I need more than that because that I don't think tights would work on that. It would have to be some leg shaven. I'm sorry, James. I'm on other things. Visual on that one was yeah. <laughs> Is that is that the thing? Oh, that is so that is cool. cool. That's I think they're, they're selling that on Amazon right now. I think it's just called like like the light up Starship Enterprise. Oh. And they do they do a little phaser pistol as well. Oh my god, how cute! I want one. That's really cute. I love that. How, and you say it's only just a couple inches tall? Yeah, it's about Perfect. maybe what three inches long, and and there's a little switch. On the bottom of the secondary hull, and the, the primary hull all lights up, and it's like a, you know, the bridge lights up, and it's like a little white light inside there. Oh, that's so great. That is nice. Yeah, I like. That's what the one of the things I like the most about the Eagle Moss, uh, the the Star Trek Starships collection, is because they are so small. You don't, you know, have room. We'll make room. I'll find room. It's so cool that they're, they're doing ships as well that I've never seen them do models of before. Like you know, they did, they finally did an Akira class starship, yes. which is one of my favorite designs. You know, what I'm really, really hoping. Is that they've been they put out that list of other ideas and they said you know what do people want to see what designs are you know do you think are cool I would really love to see them do a lunar class ship like the US oh. SS Titan yes. so amazing uh, it's so amazing and Sean, it- the designer for the Titan is going to, he just announced last week that he's going to be going to the convention in Las Vegas and I'm very excited to meet him in person after all these oh, years awesome so. have any yeah. of you um, ever seen the Star Trek Attack Wing game yes. Uh, yeah, I spent way too much money on that. Yeah, the Borg <laughs> faction is out now. Yeah, they've yeah. constantly been coming out with new stuff. Or it's pretty amazing. They've just actually, I think, announced in the last couple of days that there's a Wave 12 is coming out in February. And that's going to be, uh, I think there's like a Kazon ship. And a Kazon a, ship is out. Yeah, but this is a new one. Oh. This, this is a really big, the, the big blimp shaped kind of Kazon. Oh, ship. okay. And then there's the, and then they're doing the uh, the the Tholian web spinner from uh, Enterprise. They did that previously as like a kind of competition giveaway, but now it's going to be like you know commercially available. The Enterprise and is coming out too is soon the, too, isn't it? Yeah. And then there's the Romulan ship as well. You know the the Derridex yeah. class. There's a, a new version of that. Again, nice. I'm playing I'm playing Federation there with that, so I'm buying all the Starfleet ships that are coming out for that. Yeah, and the um the the, the uh oh. Um, <laughs> the shins, the ship shins on it. Oh, the scimitar. Yeah, the scimitar class is coming out too. Very cool. And that's all for Attack Wing. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. That means I can get it at uh, Kaboom, my right. local comic book store. Speaking of which, Terry, what's the latest there? They're still having issues with their comic book distributor to the point now where legalities have become involved. So oh now they've God. hired lawyers. And um, <clears throat> James, just to give you a little background, my comic book store has not had a comic book delivery since January. Oh, no. You have no idea. How do you live? <laughs> we, we, I am, I it's am a shame, Terry, because Ms. Marvel's awesome. I know. I, I have I not been able to pick up anything since Miss Marvel number one and uh, I'm Batgirl number I can't I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm really a tad oh. upset and it's you saw there's what one other Batgirl, there is right? there's one other comic book store in Albuquerque but they sell out so fast because their distributor works um, that most of us are kind of left out trying to just get them digitally now until they get the back order filled Spe- and it's just a nightmare speaking of back girl you saw the news this week right yes I did and I love the new outfit I hate the boots on it but that's not what I'm talking about <laughs> what they're kind of rebooting her again yeah the gal Simone's out yeah not surprising I, I just, you never know uh, I teared up I'm not really, gonna lie really I teared up yeah they've been making some pretty stupid decisions lately and and they never will be my favorite user of comic books that is all oh um See, I've never been a DC nerd. I was always a Marvel zombie from yeah. from the early days. See, I grew I up mean, adoring Marvel. Marvel was all I read, but I, for some reason now, like I, but it's only select type, like the Batman universe. I, you know, Batman, Batgirl, um, Suicide Squad. I love, but Birds of Prey. But a lot of it was Gail Simone stuff that I was reading. I know. Yeah, I mean, she great writer. Loved the storylines. I don't. I don't know. I I will never begin to understand why they tend to make some decisions that they do I, like James said there are probably things that we never understand that occur behind the scenes but both Marvel and DC they're they're both fucked up though if you follow it like daily what's going on they're both just fucked up 
<laughs> they really are. Oh, they're huge corporations now. Now, James, have you seen the uh, the, the trailer for the show that's coming on NBC here at Constantine? Uh, no, I have well clear of that because, you know, I have uh, very fond memories of the proper British version of that. And anything that anybody <laughs> tries to do to adapt it is frankly going to be disappointing. So, you know, I don't want the pain. Just, I'm just keeping, I'm keeping it at arm's length. For, 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 for the GMT show, give the trailer a look. No, no. don't. Well, don't, it's, it's, I'm it's a hard sell now. for me. You know, I still haven't been able to scrub that Keanu Reeves movie out of my head. Oh, uh, that doesn't count. It <laughs> doesn't count. That's like <sighs> Jaws 3D. It doesn't count. <laughs> hey, Jaws 3D had Michael Caine in it. You know, so Michael Caine. Okay, at least there's that about it that's good. No, that but. was Jaws 4. Was it? Yeah, the, the one where the shark follows him, like, around the planet. <laughs> oh, God. Jaws so 3D bad. was the one with uh, Dennis Quaid. Oh, okay, oh. Or I'm confusing. Uh, either way. Michael Caine, one of his most, um, to this day, one of his most un- underrated roles was as the governor of the <laughs> Caribbean island in water. It's funny, funny movie, and I think that's only three movie. Americans know of it. What was that, James? That is a great movie. That is... <laughs> As is as is uh, dirty rotten scoundrels. <laughs> I'm sorry, Michael Caine and Billy Connolly in the same film. I'm just missing. I, I I own it. I had to go out of my way and I had to find somebody who made it on DVD. How many of you? I've got to ask this question of, of you guys being a, a group of Americans. How many of you have ever seen the original version of the Italian Job? Oh yeah. I. I have not personally, but then again, I didn't see the follow-up either. Well, you know, remake. don't don't worry about the remake, because the remake's just a travesty. But the the Italian Job is probably one of the quintessentially most British films ever. <laughs> and, then I will definitely also, watch it. And it also has a fantastic performance by by Michael Caine in it as well. As in I can't, another, can't recommend it highly enough. Another film that falls in that category is is the final option. Well, which was Who Dares Wins here in the UK. Yeah. Yes, that's a. I mean, if you, I, I love. Both old style sort of like British action movies I mean there's there's like um, oh, what's the other one called North Sea Hijack with um, Sir Roger Moore in it is, is a film of a very similar kind of stripe or the the wild geese which again I love like, the wild geese I have it on DVD yeah me too do you have the special edition with all the like commentaries and everything that is yep. fantastic that, it Never heard that, of it. Oh, Terry, it's Roger Moore. Um, uh, Richard Burton. Rick, yeah, Richard Robert Burton. Robert Harris. Word. Hardy Kruger. You know, it, it's it's an all star cast. They're mercenaries who go to Africa to to get this uh, jailed African leader out, and but there's like all these subtext. And Roger Moore plays a nasty, nasty bitch in this movie. <laughs> Boy, it, James will know it. what I'm talking about with this line. Eat it. Eat it with your hands. Yeah. <laughs> okay then. Yeah, no, I have, I have, I have a movie I need to catch up on. Wild Geese was. See, Wasn't if Paul that... loves it, I yeah, then it's something I need. Oh, Apparently, oh Paul I... loves it. I can say it. You're like, no, <laughs> fuck you. Paul says it. Ooh, we don't want to give Paul another heart attack, so we'll just agree <laughs> with Paul. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, James, I know that you play Star Trek Online at times. I will play Star Trek Online. Engineering here. Warp engines are online. Course laid in, Captain. Engage. Your ship. Warning. Ship is under attack. Your crew. Move out. Your destiny. I haven't for a while, actually. I've I've been off for ages and ages. Oh, you're going to have a huge patch then. I know. That's what frightens me off now is I think, oh, hey, I'd like to play some STO. And then I think, no, I probably, you know. Uh, it, it's like if I want to play the game now, I have to remember that I want to play it like two days in advance. Yeah. And yeah, then I, yeah. You know, set my computer running and then so I can actually play it when I want to play it. Like right. before you go to bed, go ahead and patch it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I do. And now they're into pre-patching for the upcoming uh, season 9.5, which will contain all of the new crafting data. So part three of the crafting systems blog has been posted at Star Trek Online's website. So people take a look at it. Really, all it is is 
is an outline of the monetization of the crafting system that we knew was coming. So it's going to be discussing what you can get in the C-Store and um, in other forms of things for money. Yeah, it's part of the queued event as well. Right. Small pack. C-Store. <laughs> I know. Store. Zen Store, which is really what it is. But the uh, the this is kind of goes back to what Mike and I were talking about is the reason why the crafting system got loved was because they found a great way to monetize it. And other other systems in the game will get love when they find a way to make money off of it. Just letting you know now. Uh, that's, that's, the free, that's the free to play though. You know, that's the way it yeah, goes. It is. Yeah. It's true. And and something that I think people need to kind of chill out about. Nobody's forcing anybody to buy anything. And everything, and I'm kidding you not, everything that's in those containers that you can buy, don't have to buy. You can actually earn in the game. It just takes time. So it's either time or money or both. Um, let me think. And, so, and, and that's kind of it for the Star Trek news, the Star Trek online news. I know that Caspian Division is getting closer and closer to Tier 5 Starbase. Once again, we will do it over and over and over again. We still need to send out thank yous to everybody um, in the game who helped us return from the dead um, yes. after Caspian Division was wiped out by a dick. And a dick. <laughs> And we lost everything. The entire community from Jupiter Force to Stonewall to SGC to uh, all many, many other fleets came in and helped us out with donations to get us started back up again and helped us really get to start Starbase Tier 3. And we've been working hard ever since. And we're doing good. We're, we're, we're getting close to Tier 5, which will be perfect because I have a feeling we're going to need to be that way when the expansion comes out at the end of the year. And I'm hearing some very interesting interesting rumors about what it's going to be. But remember, if you work hard for more than four hours, can call your doctor. <laughs> um, in Stowe, I have now gotten my last piece of gear on my Klingon for through the rep system, so I'm oh, good for you. done with that now. Good. So you're done with all the rep systems? Yep. Nice. And he got a, and he got a full set of gear from each one. I, yeah. Well, I got all the gear from each one. The only thing I have right. le- only, only thing I haven't gotten is the consumables, and for me, that's kind of yeah. a waste. So I'm not yeah. playing Stowe anymore. <laughs> well, I finished my <laughs> Riemann set uh, for my Scorpion fighter, so it's badass. Right on. Let's get to a little bit of uh, Star Trek convention news, and then I want to talk to James about Oh, that. You, you know, you realize you forgot the biggest news story of the day. Oh? Uh-oh. Whose birthday is that? <gasps> That's right! Yes. I was, I, my God, it was right there. It is. It is. <laughs> How can you forget that it's I know, Sir Patrick. birthday today? Today is Sir Patrick's birthday, and it, which also happens to be Jean-Luc Picard's birthday, so in much of way of the same I'm tradition. not celebrating it, because that guy still owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, Sir, Sir Patrick owes you money? Sure. <laughs> Fine. It's a podcast. I can say whatever I want. See, he always says such nice things about you, man. I don't know why. You know, yeah. you're so mean to him. Because he won't introduce me to Sir Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Please talk about a guy who just keeps keeps getting cooler and cooler as he ages. Sir Ian? Yeah. Both of them. Both of them. Oh, are. speaking with James, did you see X-Men Days of Future Past? I have not seen that yet, no. <gasps> I have yet to as well, but I'm, I have to. It looks fun. The reason I say that is because there's a scene in it where, you know, there's a battle going on. That's no kind of spoiler. But Magneto turns around and walks out of the room and is heading to go outside. And it's totally wordless. And my heart just swelled because everything that guy does he just it's just so majestic yeah he's pretty cool I always remember that scene where you know where, where you first see him and um, um, Patrick Stewart we are the future Charles not them you know where he does that whole sequence that is just the two of them together on the screen just is electric and I think it was in X3 when they which you know takes a lot of heat but when the final battle's raging and the army guys come rushing out and he's so derisive it, humans and their guns <laughs> and then he realizes they're made of plastic and he's got that oh fuck face that's it now you're boned uh, I was actually in San Francisco um, a few weeks ago and I was standing um, on the shore looking at the Golden Gate Bridge and then looking at Alcatraz and going so how did he do it picked up that bridge <laughs> and he put it where how, how would that have worked okay I have an honest <laughs> question Terry you used to live in the area and everything but San Francisco seems to be such a popular place to destroy I know. What, what's up with that it's iconic 
It's the same reason, you know, New York does too a lot. And why? Because it's always such a visual to see is that what the it is Statue visually? of Liberty it's... destroyed in some fashion. The same thing goes for the Golden Gate Bridge because they kind of represent the same thing, right? Which is the gate that welcomes the outsiders. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's nothing better than to show, oh, the loss of Americana if the Golden Gate Bridge is destroyed versus the, the Lady Liberty. Sure. You I mean, say that, though, that we've been recently we've been seeing um, my hometown, London, getting spit. London's time. been getting its butt. I think it's the yeah. second. I think, you, you know what it is? It's, it's because when we had the Olympics, London yeah. was in the global consciousness for a right. while. And I think that's why oh, suddenly yeah. when people were like, hey, yeah. we haven't done that for... I was watching that the, the second G.I. Joe movie, uh-huh. and, and I'm like, you blew up my town. Okay, that's it. This is personal now. How dare you so is that. it going to be, do you think, Rio? <laughs> there you go, yeah. Will Rio, be next? Rio. You need what you need. If you want a if you want a good city to destroy, right? What you need is you need one really cool um, monument or kind of iconic symbol, like Terry exactly. was saying about the Statue of Liberty. So you could do Rio. You would blow yeah. up that big Statue of Christ the, the Redeemer. Jesus. You'd see, yeah. see that yeah. blowing up, and then it would be like, oh, the humanity. You know, that's what you need to have. Right. You need to have that one recognizable thing that can be blown up by I don't know a flying saucer or a meteorite or. or well, you know, that's quake. interesting to, to think about because with the Olympics and and World Cup and and events. World Worldwide events of that nature, to see if Rio doesn't show up in a few movies in the in the near future. I, you know what? I will if if Rio actually pulls its head out of its ass and doesn't lose the Olympics because they're on the verge of, of losing the Olympics to London right yeah. now. So. We'll see. <laughs> Did you know that, James? <laughs> oh, great! The Olympics again. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, because that was yeah. that was such a great London thing. London is last the time. It, London is the first city of choice uh, to be able to, to to pick up and run with the next Olympics if Rio cannot get it get it together. They're only twenty percent done with their infrastructure and buildings for the next Olympics. And the huh. IOC is panicking, though. Yeah, they, that's they're kind of understandable. Greece, look, they are, they are making Greece look organized, just saying. Well, when you uh, have the World Cup and then right on the heels of that, the Olympics, that's that's a little much. And and it's a poor country. Yeah. Rio is the only city in a very, very poor country. Yeah. <laughs> it's don't Southern have... Hemisphere. No one cares. No, I, oh. That's not true. <laughs> That's hey, not, I, think, I got lots of love for for, for the Brazilians. I, so I know. I'm just I know. But unfortunately, they, they've got to get it together. So we'll see. Now, I wanted to talk. Okay, real quick. Let's talk about the, the convention news. Shall we just start right off the bat with a um, Las Vegas update? Are, is, are we still talking Vegas, right? Uh, we are. We oh, Vegas. yes. You're coming to Vegas, right? Star Trek Las Vegas may take place every August, but on this show. This is where we hang out the rest of the year. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the crew has been fatigued now from so many months in space, and they need to take a break. The landing party has been down to check out the terrain while the crew Uh, we talked last week about Harlan Ellison. Being the- <laughs> by the way, I did get served by his attorneys. You did? Okay. Yeah. Not surprising. Yeah. You, you were being kind of a shit disturber last week. Yeah. I'll testify against you. Oh, uh, Of course. <laughs> the uh, convention is kind of coming up. Uh, three weeks. Big, big stuff. Uh, like I said, our, the nice news for us is that Sean is going to be able to attend. His wife is letting him go. <laughs> Thank you, Carmen. Uh, five-year mission will be there. The Did you see that the, the Rio now has... Has this voodoo zipline thing? No. It is a. It sound. It looks like it's almost like a roller coaster where there's actually seats that you sit in, and then there's a zipline that goes from the top of the voodoo lounge to the top of the other building. Oh, interesting. <laughs> oh, I'm all shaken over here. Uh, the other thing I thought was fun is that you I wonder know, if Janice will let me do that. <laughs> the Rat Pack is performing, which of course is Max Grodenchik, Vaughn Armstrong, Jeffrey Combs, and Casey Bing Biggs. But there's a a fifth spot there that says and special guests to be announced. Well, so, doesn't, uh, oh, Armin uh, normally uh, does it with them. Armin normally does it with them, so yeah, I don't know Armin's what's not going, going on. this year. Yeah, uh, it is is it the gentleman who played Vic Fontaine? <gasps> maybe, maybe. I don't know. Is 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 he going to be he there? on the guest list? No. Know. James James oh. Darren. James know. Darren's not on the guest list, so oh. I don't know. But um, shot. <laughs> oh God. Do, oh my. Oh my God. Is that really a picture of it? Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, it's a photoshopped picture of it. Yeah. Oh God, I want to do that. <laughs> 
and then of course it, our friends five year mission uh, are going to be the stage house band this year and we're very very happy for them uh, now damn it i was going to talk about briefly but one of the things i wanted to talk while james was james darren is going oh that yay, awesome. that's probably him that's probably it so um let's Boing. talk briefly about one of the things that came up mike you posted on facebook uh, uh, terry real quick what? we need to also baltimore comic-con part of the agreement have it yes it is part of the agreement go ahead talk. um a couple of new people have been announced uh richard case who started uh he got a start at marvel working on strange tales and uh doom patrol for dc he's worked on things including sandman uh preacher and a couple other things so he's going to be there tom feister i believe is his name uh who's uh worked on a lot of things including idw's gi joe origins uh and gi joe and uh the avengers assemble chris kempel uh who's an artist an amazing artist uh rich woodall he's a contributor he's worked on uh johnny ray guy the zombie bomb I love some of these names. <laughs> Kira Allen, Jungle Girl, which I kind of I kind of want to look up. Kelly Yates, who does uh, some really cool art, including she's worked uh, on IDW's Doctor Who. Nice. Um, and uh, so I'm sorry, he I said she, Jesus. But uh, yeah, so those are some new uh, new additions to the list, which is growing all the time. And, this and is when Septem- is it again? September 5th, 6th, and 7th in Baltimore at the uh, Baltimore Convention Center. Which is really cool because it's it's down in the uh, Inner Harbor area. So you're right nice. there where the the Orioles play and the Ravens play, and it's got a great nightlife in the area. So if you get the chance, uh, 54 days, September 5th, 6th, and 7th, and the GNT show will be there. And Are you guys more... doing shore leave this year? Oh, yeah, that's our problem. Is shore leave is the same weekend as Star Trek Las Vegas? They said it. Oh, okay. I know. And last year we oh we we're just heartbroken because we really do want to cover shore leave this year and unfortunately we cannot so we are committed to star trek las vegas because that's where our vendors booth is and creation moved the event back a week and so now it conflicts with shore leave which oh, us out entirely uh, are any of you guys coming to destination star trek this year in london we have uh, a, a rep there midnight shadow is our london rep he will be attending and reporting for us that is very cool. Well, um, I'm not sure if, if I'm going to be there. Um, I have been talking to Simon & Schuster's UK office, and we are discussing the possibility of doing something. I don't know if it's going to be maybe like just coming down for, to do a signing for one day, because it is, it, it's London, so it's my hometown. It's like 20 minutes right. from where I live. Oh, where so- Oh. We're trying to we're trying to see if we're gonna we can figure something out. Um, I don't know if I know, I know the guys at Simon Schuster want to do it. We've got to figure out if the the organisers of the convention will actually let us have any kind of time on stage or anything like that. And um, and I think we've they've also put out feelers to Una McCormack as well to see if she's interested because Una lives uh, in Cambridge, which which isn't too far away. So I um, love her. We're hoping her that we could do that. It would certainly be cool. Yeah, it would Una's very very much variety. be cool. And and please keep us informed of what's going on there because not only would we like to be able to support and to tout anything that you and Simon and Schuster and Uma and Una are able to come up with, but if you are going to be there, please let us know and we'll have Steve drop by with a yeah, we'll have so we can interview you. you. <laughs> <laughs> what's the facility like where that's held? Is it? Oh, it's like- a it's a it's a place called the Excel Center. It's down in London Docklands. It's basically. Oh wait, this- is that where the W the World Wrestling Entertainment goes when when they're there? I believe I believe so. It's it's basically a massive set of aircraft. Hangers. Yeah, you know, that's where it's, they it's go. a huge open space. They run a, a lot of the um, the the, the um, MCM Comic Con conventions, which are kind of like the mini mini versions of like New York Comic Con that we have every couple of months. Um, and like Worldcon this year is going to be held there, which I am also going to be going out to. Uh, oh, very a couple cool. Of days. Um, but yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a very big event, as I understand it. I'm not sure if, you know, I've never done an event with the Destination Star Trek guys before yet. Um, I, I don't know if they're, a lot of these events, they don't often have a lot of interest in, in writers. You know, they're, they're more focused on getting actors on stage mm-hmm. rather than, Which you know. Which is a shame because you guys are the ones that are really keeping the various franchises alive with your tie-in novels. Oh, tell me about it, you know, but it's, I think a, a lot of the time is that, you know, we can walk on stage and people go, well, who's that guy with the beard and the ponytail? And, you know, and they don't know who we are. But, Why um, is James Lipton here? Here. 
<laughs> I'm not that old. Come on, dude. <laughs> well, for for anybody that that's listening, that I mean, because we do have people that believe it or not will make make a snap decision and decide, hey, I want to go to London for the first time and go to this convention. What's like the the hotel situation in the area and and transit and all of that? So um, that they. I, I think that's 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 all up on you probably get well, um sorry just posted up on the uh in the forum there it's just destination star trek dot com all it's the information's all up there it's uh you know because it's not being held at a hotel it's a, it's a separate facility but there are lots of different hotels all around it and um it's slightly outside of london so you know you you won't pay the same kind of price as you pay if you were in the middle of town which would be very expensive yeah and you get all the opportunity to see all the the cool sites in that area as well it is as Wes says, not far away from from the, the former Olympic site too. Oh, Are there cool. any any eateries you would suggest to people in the area? Oh. <laughs> in that area, I don't I don't know. Just just you know, just grab whatever you can. Uh, um, there's there's a lot of great restaurants in London. I mean, you know, any, anywhere you want to go, you can just jump on a train and be in London in ten minutes. But if uh, you know, as I say, I'm still not 100 percent sure if I am actually going to be there. But um, if you guys, if you're interested and you want to keep an eye on the, uh, my my Twitter feed, which is just at JM Swallow. Um, and if anything comes up, I will definitely be tweeting the hell out of it because I love doing conventions, and it's been so long since I did a Star Trek convention. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I am actually doing a convention next year um, with Una McCormack and Garrett Wang and um, Claudia Christian. Are you going to Um No, this is um, it's First Contact Day, and it's being held over the First Contact Day weekend, you know, so April, the, oh, cool. um, April 4th and 5th. And that's at – it's up in Leicester at the uh, British National Space Centre. Oh, and that's Claudia, the thing we did Claudia a couple of days there. Did you say Claudia Christensen? Uh, yes, Claudia Christian, yeah, from Babylon 5. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> April. I get to Amsterdam in April, but I won't be going to – Oh, I'll be in New Mexico then. Yeah, you will. <laughs> You're going to be taking care of my I'll dogs. I'll be taking care of the dogs. <laughs> Hopefully the lovely Janice will be with me. Although, Chloe, you know, Chloe time. <laughs> Chloe time, that's right. So, oh, no, that's when we leave, Paul. That's when we leave. We, um, how fun. That, that's really, really cool. The um, Briefly talking about Star Trek conventions and others, what other conventions are you planning on going to besides those? Is, is it just those two that are coming up for you? Let's see. What do we got coming up? Well, um... Like I say, we've got Worldcon coming up in August. Uh, that's Loncom here in London. So I'm doing the Friday and the Saturday for, for the... And then on the... I won't be there on the Sunday because I'm actually going to the Red Bull Air Race at Ascot, which is going to be a lot of fun. I want his life. And then... And let's see what else we've got coming up. So if Destination Star Trek goes ahead, that's going to be the first weekend of October. I had really been hoping that I could make it to New York Comic Con this year. But um, that looks like, sadly, I'm not going to be able to make that. Hmm. But there may be another event that I'm doing in the UK that weekend. And then in November, there's the Black Library Weekender, which is an event for the Warhammer franchise that I work on. And that's happening in Nottingham. And that's always a lot of fun. The Nottingham? The Nottingham. Yeah, where Robin Hood comes from. <laughs> cool. And... <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. And beyond that, there's uh, there's another there's a similar event again, Black Library Live. That's in March next year, 2015. And then first contact day, as I said, which is fourth and fifth of April. Any 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 chance at all that you'll make shore leave for the fiftieth of Star Trek? Say again. Say that again. I, I missed you there. What, any what? chance you'll make uh, shore leave for the fiftieth? You, is it the 50th next year? Uh, the 2016. 2016. Oh, okay. Well, it's funny. I've been having a conversation with um, my colleagues Dave Mack and Dayton Ward yeah. about uh, about getting together for a thing and because we were talking about getting together for New York and now it's not going to happen. And I'm thinking I would really, really like to do Shore Leave again because that was such a blast. Everybody there was so welcoming. <laughs> And, uh, and it was just such fun to, to actually get to hang out and have FaceTime with all the other Star Trek writers. And I, and I really miss it. Did you guys go to any of the roasts that they did? I did. Oh, I was, my God. The Michael Dave Jan Max Friedman did. one. <laughs> yeah. I was watching that last night, the DVD, because Dave Mack sent me the DVDs. And I was thinking, man, I miss these conventions. And I thought, I know, I need something to cheer me up. So I put that DVD on, and I was just, just roaring with laughter. And I got to the end of it, and I thought, man, I have to go and do this convention again. Peter David had me dying with the uh, the Karnak thing. You are correct, sir. <laughs> hermetically sealed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm hermetic. I love those. For those that don't know, for several years as a fundraiser, David Mack and, and several of the other authors would do a roast uh, of, of the other authors, and it, it was quite hilarious. 
And you can still, I think you can still get the DVD somehow. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it still goes towards the charities. So it is quite, uh, it is quite something to see as well. <laughs> um, well, and of I'm course, gonna... Dayton and Kevin, you know, since they are Siamese conjoined twins, that they, they, they do their stuff together. Did you say you have to go, Mr. Swallow? No, no, I'm still oh, here. So I well, like, oh, I, I said we're I, almost I, done. I, I have a question. Um, if we're finished uh, and, and ready to move on. Yeah. Um, I do have a question about um, the poison chalice. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, see, here I am just kind of, you know, chattering away. I'm, for me, this is like a lazy Sunday afternoon. I'm That's sitting awesome. here with my feet up drinking a soda and like, oh, yes, oh, let's actually do some proper interview stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where did the idea for, to make Admiral Riker come from? <laughs> That was some. That wasn't. uh, That wasn't my idea. That was something that was on the table from the very beginning when we were first putting the the concept together. Is we we kind of had like a a sort of round table gathering of of all of the writers and and Margaret Clark, our editor, and and we put down a lot of the the basic beats. And Margaret said like these are the things that we want to see happen in this situation. And we said like you know we want to have this thing where when it gets to that point in the story. I mean okay obviously spoiler alert for everybody who hasn't read the book. If you haven't, stop listening. Stop listening. <laughs> plenty of spoilers. Um, when uh, we, you know, we needed someone to get promoted, and we were looking at like, well, who's the who's the right person to fit in that position? And who, you know, we we looked at who would be a sensible character, and, and we talked for a while about making it Picard. And you know, did we want to do that with him? And, and did it really fit well with the character? And in the end, everything just kept coming back to Riker, and it was the idea that that this would be an interesting situation to put Riker in. Yep. Because it would completely knock him off his game, totally right. wrong foot him, and that would be dramatically interesting. Mm-hmm. Because he is promoted to Admiral, and it's like you know he's he suddenly finds himself in a game where he doesn't know what the rules are, right. and he has to run to keep up. And I think right. that that's a great place to put a character like Riker in because he's he's always a guy who's used to being kind of on top of the game, and then you take that away from him, and he has to try to figure his way out for it. I say a lot about Poison Chalice as being a story that pegs the characters, and that is very much what that that is about. So that was one of the main reasons why we decided to do that was to just basically his- shake it up for Riker. I love Riker. His assistant, plus now he's you know Picard's boss. <laughs> oh man, I love that bit. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, um, not, I'm not hating it either, Michael. I'm just letting you know. But I'm this leaves it. me now wondering, you know, what is the future of Titan? But I know that you're working on, on on a Titan novel, and there's been another one that's been you know in the works or announced. So you know, apparently, it, Titan series is not going anywhere. Well, it's I'm going so sure. it's going somewhere, but well, it's not I mean, going it, away. It's, it's not going away. So I, that, that's a relief. Well, you know what my hope would be, right, Terry, for for the cap for someone to wear yes. the captain's tips. Yes. I would. Uh, I would. Fuck. I would lay in bed sweating with joy. <laughs> I I don't disagree. <laughs> But we we shall see. Can't we? Shall uh, we? Nick, were you saying there that you like you like the character of Riker's assistant? Yes. Yeah, Lieutenant Sura. Well, he's he is now a permanent member of the Titan crew. Oh, cool. Excellent. Just, did your girlfriend just throw something at you? What was that? <laughs> yeah. So it's my girlfriend. Like, what are you doing? Stop talking. But <laughs> <laughs> true story. Uh, Lieutenant Sura. Uh, he's a Cation. And he's this kind of skinny black and white Cation. He was actually based on my neighbor's cat, Ziggy. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would sit where I was working and I would look out of the window. And, um, and poor Ziggy's dead and gone now. But he was a lovely cat. Very, very sweet. And, and he would kind of wander around the garden. And he was a bit gangly and a little bit sort of clumsy. But he was very, very cute and very sweet. And, uh, and when I was writing the character, I thought, what's he going to look like? You know, because actions, you know, you get a vague idea of, of what they look like. And I thought, well, I want to create one who's a little bit kind of gangly and kind of off his game. And so that was where Sura came from. I love it. And so he's um, he's been he's playing a slightly bigger role in this story now because you know uh, as Riker is basically you know the, the Riker has placed his flag on board Titan so it's like you know his it is now literally his flagship it's his mobile command center and so Sura is going to be there with him working as his assistant Love and, it. and getting involved in the in the same kind of you know crazy hijinks that the rest of the Titan crew will be I'm so, so excited happy. okay I know I'm not going to get an answer but I got it now does, does my favorite Treklet character does she pin on Captain? What character would that be, Nick? <sighs> the, the lovely Christine Vale. Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> bastard. <laughs> and one he won't be answering. And, and, and in honor yeah. of you, I'll say, you bloody bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me put it this way. 
is one of the things I wanted to do um, after we after we come out of the events of the fall. You know, there, it's that, it's a very serious storyline, right? There's a lot oh, of big sh- stuff that happens. It re- we really shake up the the nature of, of politics and the and and the the world of the Federation, and we ask a lot of serious questions. And, and a lot of things are turned over. But by the time we get to the end of Peaceable Kingdoms, when Dayton ties it up in a very nice bow, even though that story is resolved, there has been a lot of changes, and the map oh, is yes. very different. You know, Absolutely. we've been doing this a lot, really, when you look at the novels, with the stuff with the Typhon Pact, you saw that, right. with the stuff with the, the Destiny Trilogy, and now with, um, with The Fall, you've seen a lot of large transitional events, which right. have now taken us to the Federation that we have in the novels, kind of circa, what are we up to now, like 2385, I think we're up to now. And so we wanted to pick up from there and say, okay, well, we're not going to do as many sort of earth-shaking events. We're going to try and get back to what's at the heart of Star Trek. We're going to have more exploration and stuff as well as having kind of, you know, things about the, what's going on at home. And if you read Absent Enemies, which is the Titan ebook that John Jackson Miller did, yep. that is very much a kind of, it's a much lighter story, and it's deliberately supposed to be one. So there's, there's a lot of kind of action going on there. It's got some really funny stuff going on as well. Uh, I think John does a fantastic job getting the voices of the characters. And that's almost like, um, I guess, it's almost like, uh, you know, the, the curtain falls on, on the fall and then it rises again with, with absent enemies and we start a new, almost a new phase of the Titan character storyline. And I'm going to pick up with that with Sight Unseen. So when Sight Unseen begins, there are a number of events that change. You're going to see some new characters coming into the story. Good. Some of them that you'll recognize and some of them that you won't. Some characters go through changes. Someone will die in the course of Sight Unseen. And that's an exclusive. I haven't told anybody else that yet. Someone's going to die in the course of wow. Sight Unseen. <laughs> And this is what it's so funny is that this is what I was going to talk about when I was going to say I want to talk, I wanted to ask you one one brief question and that was something Mike posted on Facebook this week kind of uh, brought it around Mike has been writing lately but Mike what did you write about killing off a character I killed off uh, uh, two this week uh, in you, one in one day you killed off <laughs> you killed off two in one day and then I started laughing and I said yeah well be careful because once you once you have a fan who likes a character and you kill them off that fan will harass you endlessly for the rest of your life and like I killed off a character in one of my fix that Will has never forgiven me for. I'm I'm just asking you now, James, in the your idea about what it I, I know you're the kind of writer, I know you are the writer that tends to not tends to, but always kills off a character with meaning. That there's never a reason why you do it just for dramatic effect, just to pull. It, it's not. You do it for reasons, and all the, all oh, the yeah. Star Trek authors do. But do you ever take? I mean, how do you react to killing off a character you really like? Well, that's you know, you know, it's it's very easy to kind of fall into that rut where you think like, oh, I like all these guys. They're really cool. I'll just uh, you know. I'll just carry on with them and they'll do what they do and they'll keep on going on and they'll stay in that same situation. And you can very easily just kind of get stuck in that and it all becomes very cozy and it's very kind of easy, but it's, it's, it's all the same and it doesn't have any edge to it. And I think one thing that you have to remind people about is that the, you know, the Star Trek universe is not a safe place. It is dangerous. And you have to make it clear to people that there, you know, there are times when bad things can happen. And there's a lot of jeopardy going on in Sight Unseen. I mean, just uh, this today, I've been writing like a huge phaser battle taking place on the ship where lots of people's lives are in jeopardy. And there's lots of dangerous situations and, you know, characters getting into serious, serious issues. And so you have to make it clear that this, this, nobody is safe, even the main characters. There's always the possibility that something bad will happen because that's what it's all about. Remember what Kirk said, risk is our business. Right. You have to show that there is risk to this. That means so it's that was part of my clear. decision. Mm-hmm. That was part of my decision is coming into this novel. Is I thought, you know, there's going to be some shakeups. I'm, I want to bring some new characters in. I want to change the dynamic on the bridge a little bit. <laughs> let me and, let, let me make this perfectly clear. <laughs> if you all thought, if you authors thought the Janeway people were bad, she was killed <laughs> off. You will not have seen anything if Christine Vale is killed. <laughs> I will be Matt Decker obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, 
also remember this is this is the same guy that went batshit out of his head when when Baco died. You got damn right. <laughs> so that was a tad of a and shock. And he's he's never for, he's never forgiven um, uh, George. Well, that was that wasn't Dave again. That you got to blame Margaret Clark for that. That wasn't Dave George's idea. He just wrote it. I if Christine Bell dies, they will get very used to seeing me outside the editorial offices. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Nick, you need to read. You need to catch up on some reading, sweetheart. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, but the, you know, to come back to your question, Terry, is that part of what I wanted to do with, with this story is, and again, this is something I had a long discussion with uh, Margaret Clark about. So originally, I was saying to her, well, you know, we, we, have the, we brought the Titan crew back from their mission out past the Vela Pulsar and the Gum Nebula, and the, where they were really out on the very ragged edge doing kind of the strange new worlds thing. Right. And I said to her, okay, well, you know, the, the fall is over now. And uh, I'd, I'd like to send them back out there. And she said to me, you know, that just I'm, I'm, that, that doesn't work. That's not that's not going to happen. We can't just put these characters back where they were. And I stepped back and I took a look at it and I thought, you know what? She's absolutely right. right because the status quo has changed. And the more right. I thought about it, the more I, I, I thought, you know, that's exactly the best steer. And so I said, okay, if we're going to do this, if we're going to change things, then let's really change things. Let's Let's do some stuff that shake things up a little bit, that alter the dynamic of the crew. What I was especially interested in was doing something that would take existing relationships between characters that you already know and changing those. So, you know, you think you know how, let's say, Tuvok and Troy get on, get along. Let's do something that will change the way that relationship works. So you think you know how it works. No, actually, now it's different because of this change in circumstances. So that's just a, I'm just using that as an example, by the way. That's not actually something that's in the book. But there will be those kind of changes happening. There will be people, you know, positions that will be altered, power dynamics that will shift, and characters will find themselves in circumstances that they weren't in before. And you'll see maybe a different facet to them, as well uh, as having sort of action and adventure stuff blowing up and strange aliens and, uh, you know, daring do. Well, so that's, that's kind of that's kind of what I hope to do. Is I, kind of, I, I hope I've kind of shaken things up a little bit. I, that's one of the things I truly appreciate about how all of Star Trek fiction and literature has moved forward is that it, they do allow the characters to move forward. They allow um, storylines to affect them and to continue to affect them. And they allow for the changes that take place, which is exactly what you would expect in real life. And I, I love that about all of Trek lit since destiny. So thank you very much for that. I, I, I know that it's not always easy to deal with the people who want to, to see the, the show kind of in that, that little microcosm and stay in that perfect little no globe, so to speak. But I like the fact that you guys are bre- branching it out. It's very fun. Yeah, that, that is, the, you hit the nail on the head there, Terry, is that we do have, we're kind of in a, uh, being pulled in two different directions doing this sort of thing. Because on the one hand, people who like tie-in stuff are people who go, well, you know, this is a thing I like. Let's say it doesn't matter if it's Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever franchise it happens to be. They say, you know, I like this thing and I want more of that thing. And I want to have it to be slightly different from the original thing, but not too different because I enjoy right. the feeling of, you know, let's say we're talking about Star Trek characters going off and exploring strange new worlds. Right. And you can have those stories and you can tell different versions of that story. But it, like you say, it feels like it happens inside this little bubble, inside this little snow globe. And it doesn't change. Now, you can enjoy a story like that, but there is something about it that is lost because you lose that sense of evolution. Right. And one of the things that we want to do with the novels and we're trying to continue to do is to give you that sense of growth and change. Right. Obviously, we can't go too far down that road. We can't kind of completely pull the rug out and kill off a whole bunch of characters and say, okay, you know, scorched earth, we're starting again. We can't go as as radical as that. And we're always being pulled between those two poles because we want to satisfy both audiences. Right. And unfortunately, if you if you have those two audiences, there's going to be one on either side who will say, well, you haven't changed it enough, or you've changed it too much, and you're never going to make everybody 100% happy. Right. And that's that's kind of part of the problem. I try to err on the side that I think most people in enjoy the evolved characters. So that's where I'm trying to go. I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm the biggest Titan fan out there. <laughs> and I love where the characters have gone and where they're going. I like the fact that we're getting that evolution, as you say, and the promotions and how they affect a character, because I find those characters so compelling that I want to know what it's like for them to deal with those kind of real life issues is how would Riker deal with something that throws him off his game? I'm finding this fascinating reading because I love his character 
and I like the characters on the ship altogether. And I do like the fact that the, the crew tends to change. Why? Because that's what happens in real life. You look at a paramilitary or military organization, the crew doesn't stay the same for all the time. It constantly changes. Unless so, you look the card and you don't ever have to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, except don't even, it, well, and using that as um, a great thing is, uh, or a great example is, I happen to be one of those quote unquote those fans that didn't like the direction that Picard went after Destiny or after whatever before Destiny when everything started to go. I didn't like the, the, that particular direction that Picard went because I didn't personally think that's where his character would have gone. Be that as it may, the fact that you guys are exploring what it's like for him to be a husband and a father is is interesting because you are taking his character and saying what would he be like if if that's the direction he went. So I I I, I deal with that and I move forward with it and I make fun of it. And as a fan, that's I still buy the book. So. Well, you know, we talked about um, you know changing when we were doing before. We talked about changing Picard's circumstances, and and one of the things that was briefly on the table dear about making him president of the UFP. And, you know, we, we had that, we had one of those, we had one of those conversations where we were like, okay, everything's on the table. No idea is too stupid. No idea is too wild. What should we do? You know, Dave Mack talks about that uh, trilogy he was going to write that was going to end with the death of Picard. And that, right. you know, that was an idea, that was an idea that was on the table and then that never happened. And when we were talking about the four, we were like, okay, what, what characters have we got? What situations could we have? You know, right. w- would it make sense for us to have, you know, the Enterprise E gets destroyed or we have Picard sacrifice his life or, you know, something terrible happens to him. Does it make sense that, you know, Riker gets promoted to Admiral or should it be some other character? You know, should we bring Cisco into this story so he can be doing this thing instead of having Riker do that thing? And one of the ideas that came up is we said, well, at the end of the story, we need a new president of the, of the UFP. Who could it be? And we talked about a lot of different characters. And, and naturally, Picard's name ended up in the mix. Jellico. President Angelico. <laughs> oh, well, he, he, actually, yeah, actually, he would have been an interesting choice. Now, think about it. Yeah. Um, and we talked about it for a while. And we, well, you know, how, could that work? Could he end up being president of the Federation? You know, I could see him doing that. But then we kind of realized that, you know, you can't unring that bell. If, if we did that, it would be a yep. very radical change. Yep. We couldn't have him be president for for four years and then go back to being a Starfleet captain. That just kind of wouldn't work. It just wouldn't feel realistic. So in the end, we decided not to go that way. And, and that idea was, was put to one side. But for a little while, we talked about it, you know, and, and we have these kind of conversations all the time, you know, about, you know, when we're doing these ongoing storylines, we're talking constantly about how does this fit here? And, you know, what's going on with these characters there's stuff that um dave mack set up with julian bashir in um oh. in um oh God, what's yes. that? i forgot the, the title of his book in zero sum game no no the no. Is, is um his book in the in the fall yeah in the fall series um, oh uh, so, uh, ceremony of losses yeah ceremony of losses that's right yeah yeah because some of so he sets up stuff about um about bashir in ceremony of losses and he had ideas about how he wanted it to, to play out. And then I came along in Poison Chalice, and I changed a whole bunch of stuff. And he was like, I didn't want you to do that. And I'm like, too late, buddy. This is the way I'm doing it. And he's like, okay. And, you know, and so, you know, but we talked it out, and we found a way that made everybody happy. And now, um, you know, so at the end of Poison Chalice, you know, I, I take kind of Bashir, and I say, okay, I'm putting him here on the board, and that's where he's left. And Dave's got his new Section 31 novel, Disavowed, which is coming up. And that's going to pick up Bashir's storyline from where I left him. And that's oh, going to take right. him off in an interesting direction. See, so we're, all, we're constantly, we're constantly having these conversations. It has got to be the most fun to be able to it play is, in this in the universe. Well, it is as, pretty crazy. As a writer, James, I, I have a question for you that I, I was actually wondering about last week because you, the way you write, Titan, you you really have like the the, the ear for for Riker and and that crew, and Una. Oh my God, that she has the Cardassians. She just, something about the way she, she writes the Cardassians is amazing. Is there is there any group or a character that when you're writing them you 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 find you have to work for it more than than like you would for Riker? Oh, Picard, totally, definitely Picard. <laughs> Because I I found um you know from the beginning I'm not saying he's not a great character um but from the very beginning of watching him on TNG I always felt he was a bit stiff yeah and and a, a bit hard for me to empathise with that's why I always liked Riker better because I connected to him much more quickly right and so I've always found it difficult to kind of get the tonality of Jean Luc Picard that's why 
when um, Pocket came to me and asked me to do a novella for the ebook series, and they said, look, you know, what, what are you thinking about? But we, we kind of like the idea of you doing a TNG story. And, and I, my first thought was, okay, well, where, you know, where are the TNG characters in, in, in the continuity right now? And it's like, this is, a, this is a, a book that would be led by Picard. And to begin with, I was thinking, I don't know if I can do it. And, then in, and that was the thing that made me decide to do it because I felt like I didn't have a handle on the character. And I thought, I should try, I should try to get this done. I should see if I can write a good Picard story. So I felt yeah, like I had to work harder. Time. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I had to work harder to get Picard's voice. Yeah, uh, and I'm very, and that was, uh, and that was stuff of dreams. And I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. I think it felt to me like I, I did the job right. But it was, a, it was harder for me to kind of get inside his head than it is for maybe, you know, a, a character like Will Riker, who I feel like is a little but closer you, you to You write him, so, yeah, you, you write Riker so naturally that that's why I'm such a big it's, Titan it's fan. It's the beard, Terry. That's what it is. It was. Yeah. Well, well yeah. What, does, what does it say about, the, like, a writer that, like, okay, uh, Keith has the Klingon thing, it, Una has the, the Cardassian, that Dave Mack is so in tune with the Borg. I wonder what that says about about him <laughs> that he's a heartless machine what no <laughs> that's not true he is the he is a, p- a planet killer i'm, I'm just the saying. angel of death and you and and yet you meet him in person and he's the sweetest man you've ever known <laughs> next, so Del- next to kevin dillmore <laughs> i'm a huge I'm, kevin dillmore fan kevin's no. a lovely guy the, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I am very lucky that I get to work with a, a, a real bunch of, of, of funny, talented, intelligent people. You know, it's, it's, it's funny when we were working on the, the, the fall, once the kind of, you know, we were all kind of putting the room together. And it's like, okay, these are all the guys that you're working with, the guys and girls you're working with. At the moment where we were obviously sizing each other up thinking, oh, man, I've got to bring my A game because all these guys, you know, everybody, every, Dave George, Dave Mack, Luna McCormack, Dave Ward, you know, these are all good writers, and I can't look bad around them. You know, I can't be the guy who drops. I can't be the guy who fumbles. You can't you know, be the guy who fumbles. This is a relay fumbles. race. Well, and you know, on. that's funny because remember Dayton told us the same thing, Terry, about right. doing the wrap up of it. That you guys had all done this amazing, and then how did he? He didn't want to be the guy that tripped going over the, the finish line. Uh, when I, I remember yeah. Dayton and I probably had the most conversations when we were working on the fall because because it was me and him. I was you know I'm, I'm writing Poison Chat and I'm handing off to him to do um, uh, Peaceable Kingdoms. And it was, I, I, said, I can remember saying to him at the beginning, okay, man, well, basically what I got here is a basket full of dirty laundry. So here you go. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Deal with that. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to be the guy who did that. And one so really fun went, thing that out, man. For, for people that, because you know, we still have people in our audience that they're, they're discovering through our show, the, 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 the lit universe. The lit universe, right? Is that while you guys have this all going on, there's Kristen's got out in in with the Voyager fleet. There's things going on there, and Peter David has a, in the New Frontiers land uh, with Calhoun. The things going on there. So there's just so and then Keith with the, the the Klingon stuff, and so you've got all of these different things going on. That it's far. The the universe has expanded so much in the Trek universe with the, the everything going on yeah. in these books. And and the way that fucking the Andorian crisis hit the Voyager fleet. Well, we tried to create the idea of the you know this is a contiguous world. This is going back to what Terry said earlier about the you know the snow globe effect. Right. Is we try to make it feel like everything is connected. Not not to such a point that if you don't read absolutely every book, you're going to be completely at sea because that's not going to be fair to people. You know, it's not like doing one of those crazy comic book crossovers where every character appears in everybody else's book and it's like, oh, okay, I, I didn't read this issue, so I don't know what the hell's going on. Right. But what we're doing is, I guess, if you do invest, if as a reader you are willing to put the time in to read a lot of the books and to and to kind of really invest in the world, then we will out, what we will do is we will pay you back for that investment by connecting it up. So you will read it and go, oh, that guy who turned up in this poison in Poison Chalice is now going to be referenced in, say, you know, uh, Disavowed, and there might be a reference in Disavowed that will play out in the next Voyager novel, and that in turn may connect to something that Chris Bennett did set 200 years earlier in, you know, his uh, Rise of the Federation Enterprise era books or something like that. So we stuff up, and that's our way of saying, you know, thank you for paying attention. We are paying attention too, and we're going to connect these little things up and it's going to feel like one whole big world and one thing that i've noticed because of, of the way that you guys do it you do it so well
well that it makes me want to go back and read some of those earlier books to find out <laughs> what exactly I've missed. Yeah, what the yeah. whole story is. Not it's the literary equivalent of going on Netflix and looking back at season two of a series and when you're in season seven and going, oh my God, that character was now always I there. Mm -hmm. the, the hard part about writing that stuff is you have to make sure that you're not stepping on anybody's toes or doing stuff wrong. Is the amount of times I will write something and go, wait a minute, did this happen then? Do I have to go back and check? Oh, wait, did, did this, where did, oh, and what, where, oh, no, that's not a neat encyclopedia. Oh, wait, wait. You know, I'm, I'm calling people up and I'm looking on memory alpha and memory beta and I'm like, no, it's not there. Okay, we're, we're filing, you know, did you do this in your book? No, that's what he did. Oh, no, you know, trying to chase down some really obscure piece of information. How much time? And yet it's, you, it's, it's really fun. How much time do you, pull, do you spend pulling hair out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, mostly it's me I'm just tugging on my beard that's usually that's usually I'm like kind of pulling the hairs out my beard going what but it's, okay, it is crazy when you too. find <laughs> like when I was writing uh, Poison Chalice and I, I was I was doing a scene where um, Deanna Troy is having a conversation with Julian Bashir and I suddenly thought these two people have never met no. and, it, and I thought that, surely that can't be right you know in, in all the hundreds of books that have been done and the comic books and everything that they must these two main characters from two different shows they must have have crossed paths somewhere, and I and I had to, and I was right in the middle of doing the scene, and I had to stop dead because I thought, well, the tone of that scene will be completely different if they'd never met, and if they have met, it'd be completely different again. So I had to stop what I was doing, and and just start recent and, and embark on this major research project that ate up maybe like two hours of my day, yeah. trying to see if there was ever any evidence that these two characters have ever had a conversation before. Drilling down through all these different things, phoning up people, looking online, you know, and in the end I found out that as far as I could discover, they had never met. So I had to go back and completely rewrite the conversation to reflect the fact that this was the first time they'd had that conversation. And it's just a small scene, and you as the reader probably would go past that and maybe not even register that that was going on, but there's... That's an example of the way that sometimes these things will just pop out of nowhere and it just, oh, I've got to research all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, Otherwise, I can see... someone will be upset. I can see where... I, I think back on it and I go, there's always that, like you said, there was never ever any evidence that they had met. There were certainly been opportunities. They at the same place at the same time, but not... Right. Not, yeah, we never saw them on screen, never... Interesting. And it would be just as easy, easily arguable that they had not met as it would have been to say that they had met through a hallway or at dinner or something. You never know. Yeah, I mean, I could have easily just kind of said, um, oh, yeah, I remember that time we met and, and exactly. never explain it and just right. pretend that they'd actually met, uh, you know, on the off chance that somebody else had. And I thought well, it's it's much more fun to have that conversation the That's first fun. time because, they're, yeah. because, you know, they're two iconic characters from two different shows. Right. And the idea of having them in a room together is, yeah, you know, with, with her empathic abilities, what would Deanna Troy think of a man like Julian Bashir? And and what and with his kind of analytical sort of skills, what would he think of a person like her? That's an interesting conversation to have. Oh, uh, yeah. Terry, have you have you gotten to to James's book yet? I'm in ceremony of losses right now. Oh, okay. Same. I've got to be careful about spoilers. It's okay. okay. No, no, no. It's okay. She, I, she drives on them. I I don't mind spoilers. They do not bother me. As a matter of fact, they tend to work towards the opposite. If I know something's going to happen, I have yet to be put off by any movie or any book because I know what's going to happen. I, I actually, I'm actually one of those people that in, in my past I used to read the last chapter first. So <laughs> I know, I know. That's just me. <laughs> well, we'll I eat see. the dessert and then enjoy my dinner. <laughs> well, the, the the okay. Well, this is a spoiler then. Um, um, okay. There is a certain other gentleman who appears in the course of Poison Chalice, uh, a certain brother of a bearded <sighs> ca captain of your, you may be familiar with. <sighs> That's Speaking right. of which, Terry, I'm so excited. Hmm? Huh? I didn't know if you had it. They had Thomas Riker action figures at that place no? yesterday. You don't have one? I have one. I have the Diamond Select Thomas Riker with the trombone. <sighs> Fuck, I should have got it then. <laughs> See, Tom Riker was a – again, that's another character that was uh, a, a, an I entire research process on his own because I had to go back and I had to pick through every single reference to that character. And he's appeared in a lot of weird and different places, and yeah. some of those references are slightly contradictory. Yeah. And so I, and I had to find a way that would bring them together that would make it so that I don't contradict the contradictions but yet still have him involved in the story in a meaningful way. 
And so that was a fun, one of my favorite scenes to write in the book, actually, is a scene where Tuvok is undercover, and he's meeting a guy in a bar, and this guy sits down next to him, and it's Will Riker, except it isn't Will Riker. Oh, very And cool. Tuvok's conversation is like, you know, wait a minute, I know you. And, he's, and, and Will's like, you really don't know who I am. I'm not that, I'm not that guy. And, and, of course, the thing is, is that Will Riker and Tuvok have already met. If you right. go back to the, the, the Double Helix series, which is a way back, they, they had a conversation back when Tom was still in Starfleet and he hadn't gone off to join the Maquis and Tuvok was undercover in the Maquis. Oh, so that was a lot of fun kind of riffing on that because, you know, now it's like, you know, Tuvok saying to him, oh, yeah, you know, you quit Starfleet and went to join the Maquis and Tom saying, yeah, and you were lying about being in the Maquis because you were actually an undercover Starfleet officer. What's up with that? <laughs> I love it. I love That's, it. It's fun to do that kind of stuff, you know? Very cool. Oh, my God, James, I want to talk all day long. I wish we could. I really do. I wish we could. But now I'm going to finish Ceremony of Losses and get myself back into all sorts of... A double dose of... of I'm going to take a spa in Riker. This is going to be great. Well, yeah, I I haven't read any track books for a little bit just because I got on my Neil Gaiman uh, kick. kick and then and then started reading the Barsoom series, the Edgar Rice Burroughs. I, I just started and uh, but I'm, I'm reading uh, Linda Poivian's second book right now and when I'm done with that, I'm going to get ben? back into it. Yeah, it, I just needed a break because I had read like literally 12 Star Trek novels in a row. <laughs> And I just needed a break. Well, I'm just, I'm very thrilled that you were able to join us, Jim. And it was just an absolute blast talking to you again. Now, remind everybody the projects you're working on, when they're coming out, and how people can follow you on Twitter. And which video game this is? (laughs) Yeah, nice try. (laughs) Damn it. You almost got me. No. No. Well, let's see. Um, is it Lara Croft? Say, is it Tomb Raider? Is it Tomb Raider? It's not, it's not Tomb Raider. My my friend Rihanna Pratchett is working on on Rise of the Tomb Raider. Oh, cool. oh really? Well, yeah, that's not that's not a secret. Everybody knows. No, that. but that's cool that you know somebody that's working on it. Yeah, she was one of the writers on the the the, the first game as well, and uh, she's going to be involved but in the in the sequel as well. The first one, or the I think they've got first they've got a whole team of people working on it. But that is going to be a very cool game. Yeah. So what have I got coming up? Let's see. Um, so I have, as I said, I have um, the Horus Heresy Shield of Lies audio book that's coming out in December this year. And I also have a short story coming out for the Warhammer franchise that's going to be announced later on. Um, then in the new year, in 2015, we've got the German edition of The Stuff of Dreams, Der Stoff der Trauma. So for all the German ebook readers out there, that's going to be coming out in February. Uh, the Titan novel, Sight Unseen, that's probably coming out in the fall. Um, and I have another Star Trek novel that will be coming out. I'm not sure if that will be in 2015, maybe early 2016. Uh, and that's and I think the original the, series one, right? Yeah, and uh, and there's also going to be a German edition of uh, Poison Chalice, I think, is coming out in 2015 as well. I think uh, all the German readers... Can't wait readers, to see the cover on that one. Yeah, they always yeah. do such a fantastic job, the cross card guys, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yes, they and, do. uh, and then the, the big video game project, that, will be in the, that probably will be announced in the summer of 2015. So maybe towards the end of the year, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. If you want to follow me online, you can find me on Twitter at JM Swallow. And my blog is called Red Flag. And that's jameswallow.blogspot.com. Or is it .co.uk? I can never remember. And I also have like a Tumblr where I occasionally post pictures of things or interesting clouds that I might have seen. Uh, but generally, if you want to follow, follow me there or follow me on my uh, live journal account, Twitter is usually where I end up posting most of the stuff about what I'm doing, and I try to be clever and educational and funny. Awesome. Thank you. Mike, do we have any announcements before we tie it up? Um, <laughs> well, there, there's Whoa, always... I, we're number, our, our interview with James Swallow and, and Kipley Brown... James Curley. Is, uh, what did I say? James Swallow? James sorry, Curley. James. <laughs> I'm all... He, with I'm the sorry. swarthy he's, one. He's got me all, all excited. Um, with, sorry. With <laughs> Good God. She still can't get through it. <laughs> it's the end. Take <laughs> with, a deep breath. It's okay. okay. With James Kerwin and Kipley Brown, there who will, will be our guests at the GNT show booth at the Star Trek Las Vegas convention coming up in three weeks. Uh, their interview with them is number, what are we, 20 on the Mixcloud interview now? As of this morning, yes. Number We're ranked 20. number 20 on Mixcloud. Thank you all for listening to us through Mixcloud and our other social media sites because uh, apparently, you know, giving social media metrics is important to convention mm-hmm. throwers, whatever. <clears throat> and uh, we are also have a YouTube 
channel. We have, so that's Mixcloud, YouTube. You can, of course, download us through iTunes. You can download us from our website. And We're on Stitcher as well now. Oh, Stitcher. Cool. Which, Mike, have- I was asked yesterday by one of the artists, because uh, we were talking about the show, and I'll talk to you and Terry about that later, because there's some people that want to come on the show. Um, <laughs> about, and she, she's one of the artists, and she was like, are you guys on Stitcher? And I said, why, yes, we are now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> because she, when she's driving to conventions or whatever, that's how she listens to podcasts. Awesome. Right and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Terry Lynn S. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Sunday GNT. Mike? I'm Ceridium STO. That's S O R I E D E M S T O. And Getty. And I'm at Gettysburg 7. That's the number 7. And we have, you said our Facebook page, right, Terry? Uh, Facebook page is the GNT show. And uh, just a little little something for our audience to ponder uh, this, this week as you're going about your life. Um, there was a thing that went viral this week. It was a photo of Steven Spielberg sitting next to a Triceratops. <laughs> and it's, you know, some Somebody jokingly said about look at the big game hunt or whatever, and there were people that were who honestly believed he really did kill a dinosaur. Who believed yeah. he did, and were thinking he oh. killed it for the horns. Now remember that the next time there's a social media uproar about something a celebrity says that gets them fired or banned or whatever, these are the same people who believe a triceratops <laughs> was killed by Steven Spielberg. So let's take that into account. I'm just I'm serious. That thought came to me the other day when I was like, but these I- are the people that write in to the FCC. The people that believe Steven Spielberg killed a triceratops. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, that that particular image, that tri- that in the scene in the film, the triceratops wasn't dead. It was right. sick. And that but was right it, before they started digging through a six-foot pile of poo. And Laura Dern reached in, exactly, <laughs> and smelled it. But, yeah, just think about that, people. This is the world we live in, where those are the people with ten letters that can alter our favorite shows by getting things banned. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. I did. I thought but it it's was scary. Very, very funny. It's very scary. Oh, I know. That, I know. Because remember the family guy where... As we know, one letter letter equals a million people. I'm not going to end this show on a whole diatribe about how stupid people can be. No, I think that's what we're just doing. It is comically stupid. Yeah, that's funny. (laughs) Okay. Oh, James. And your, Thanks your, again. Your lordship, oh, mighty, high, and amazing gull swallow. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you. Call him gull swallow. Yeah, I don't Is he still know with why. us? He's on mute again. Oh, God. because <laughs> I didn't call him Leggett. Am I? Hello. There's the Leggett. <laughs> Leggett swallow. Thank you, guys. You guys, are, you guys are always so nice to me. So we you're always you. so respectful, which is lovely because I don't get any respect anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, what and some, some, I always think, like, are you, are you being sarcastic? I, no. no, I can't tell. No, but it's always <laughs> it's always a pleasure to be on here. But this, you know, this never feels like work to just hang out and talk about Star Trek. You know, in well, fact, uh, you know, you guys have really helped as well because when I'm when I'm writing stuff like this, sometimes you get so bore sighted, you get just completely focused on it, and you almost can't see the wood for the trees. And sometimes that kind of essential spark of of how cool it is to be writing about Star Trek sometimes that kind of you lose sight of that and it's always nice to have a conversation like this because I walk away from it thinking man I get to write Star Trek that's awesome it is awesome and even better for me I personally thank you for writing Riker his favorite and you're my favorite Riker author so thank you thank you thank you and you're welcome go write write Riker would you (laughs) you're welcome to drop by okay well you know absolutely love having you you. we do we love having you have a great weekend everybody we will see you next week for episode 151 which will be our Star Trek Las Vegas precursor to the precursor, whatever yeah. you want to call it. I may not Getting be crazy. able to make it. Uh, I won't oh. know until this week. Okay, well, we'll keep you informed. Because of shooty things. He has shooty things, which means we might have Black Magnum on. We'll see. Have a great have one, a everybody, week. and we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. GNT Show is a busy little beaver production. Music for the GNT Show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation. I'm gonna take a five year tour. Only go where no man.